Yep, should be live, Senator. Okay, I wanna welcome everybody. I'm Senator Kevin Avard from District 12, Senate District 12. And today we are uh, holding a meeting of uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee. And before we get started, I'd like to read through a checklist to ensure that the meeting that we are holding is in compliance with the right to know law. So as chair of uh, Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12 pursuant to executive order 2020-04 and its extensions, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. In accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we're providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibly by video and other electronic means. We're utilizing Zoom for electronic meetings and all members of the committee and selected legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously in this meeting through this platform and the public has access contemporaneously, uh, watch and listen uh, to the meeting or Zoom, YouTube and video phone by following the directions and links provided on the general court website. We have provided public notice of, ne uh, of the nece uh, necessary information for accessing the meeting in the Senate calendar. We are providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting. And if there's any problems with access or if anyone has a problem, please email remote Senate at ledge.state.nh.us or call 603-291-6931. I'll repeat that. Uh, remote Senate at ledge.state.nh.us or call 603-271-6931. In the event that the public is unable to access the meeting, it will be adjourned and rescheduled. Please note uh, that all votes taken during this meeting shall be done by a roll call vote. And finally, let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. Uh, when each member states their presence, please also state where they are and if anyone else is in the room with you. And during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. So now I will call the roll, um, starting with Senator Gray, this is Senator Gray. I'm at my home in Rochester and I'm alone in this room. And Senator Gaida, welcome. Senator Gaida and at my home in Warren. Uh, my grandson and daughter are upstairs. They may transit, but I'm at this time alone. Senator Waters. I am in Dover alone in this room. Senator Perkins Quoka. Thank you, Chair. I, Senator Perkins Quoka, I'm at my office in downtown Portsmouth and I'm alone in this room. And I'm Senator Kevin Avard. I'm in district, uh, in my home here in Nashua, uh, in my office, and I'm alone with my puppy dog. Uh, that's it. So let's get started, and we'll let the, the uh, first uh, person speak on introducing this bill, which I believe is Senator Waters. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Senator David Waters, District 4, and I'm introducing today Senate Bill 146. This is omnibus legislation sponsored uh, many parts by myself and other parts for other uh, senators. Um, for those who are following along for the hearing, uh, please note that there are amendments to parts three, parts four, and parts five, which the, is what I will be discussing with the, with the committee. So Mr. Chairman, if I may, I will start with the uh, first part of the um, omnibus, part one. Uh, this bill may be familiar to Senator Gaida because uh, we worked this through this bill last year to establish the coastal program in state statute and to set up a fund for it to receive federal and other grant uh, funding for its work. Um, the bill got caught up in the COVID uh, pandemic. So here it is again. And just to tell you a little bit about um, the coastal program, this is an existing program um, that is supported by federal statute and, uh, and primarily by federal funding. And um, its real purpose is to help municipalities to deal with environmental 
regulations passed by the state and by um, the federal government. Um, it has no regulatory authority it, itself. It is uh, meant to be a tool for the municipalities to use to do what they've got to get done to get their de de to do developments and uh, attend to environmental issues in their um, in their community. Um, so the first part, uh, so and the reason for wanting to have this in, in um, state statute is that it's an existing state program and DES will be hearing uh, from its its director and uh, they do great great work and having an state statute um, clarifies its mission and also would uh, I think enable to receive um, again not state funding but funding for some other sources through the fund that is um, th that is set up. So it establishes the program and um, references uh, the Coastal Zone Management Act, which authorizes these coastal programs in, uh, in coastal um, states. And uh, it, um, its purpose is to encourage and assist state and federal agencies and coastal zone municipalities in the sustainable use of land and water resources of the coastal zone, giving full consideration to ecological, cultural, historic, aesthetic values, as well as the needs for compatible economic um, development. So this is this is what it does. It, it attends to those things as required by federal statute, but its real point is to help you miss it so they can continue to grow and do their sustainable um, development. And uh, so it lists the kinds of things that it's currently doing here on the first page there, sections one and, and two, um, you know, and, and some particular things that are being faced by our waters and and bridges that are doing a lot of work now um, to help places that are you know flood prone because of all the increased rainfall or storm surge or um, you know we're starting to see groundwater levels rising on the sea coast and uh, of course uh, sea level rises as, as well um, uh, salt water intrusion and so forth so uh, this is important work that it, it does and it is um, lay out there um, it also lays out I think importantly. Next, the um, kinds of coordination, simplification of, of procedures, you know, time is money for developers. So this, this coastal program works to make sure that, um, you know, things can be done expeditiously and not get tied up unnecessarily in, in regulation um, and make sure we have good decision making and timely decision making as well. And then the top of uh, page three, um, I think you'll hear from municipalities on the coast that they do a great job in helping with conservation planning, conservation and management, that they can come in and uh, when a municipality is doing coastal planning or, or um, is uh, doing uh, master planning or developments and so on, uh, that it has the maps, it has the um, technology and the expertise um, available to address things that are being faced on the coast. Um, section Roman 10 there, in terms of these issues on the coast of storm surge and precipitation and so forth, um, just should note that th this the taking into account these projections and these issues that are facing the coast is mandated elsewhere in state statute. So again, it's just doing the work uh, that we've told it to to do. And also, I'll mention, as you may have seen in the news, that we have new FEMA maps coming out on uh, flood zones, which is you know which is what drives flood insurance and so on. So lots of homeowners and municipalities are gonna really need this help in coming years to um, understand just where, where they are at. Then lastly, as I said, it establishes the fund in the treasury um, which can receive monies that are available from grants, gifts, donations, particularly federal grants, uh, matching funds and, and so forth. That that's, that will be useful for that as well. So um, I will stop there. Uh, Mr. Chairman, on that one. I apologize, I was unmuted. I was, I was muted. Oh, I love electronics. Okay. Um, so next, we will hear from the uh, next part. part uh, Senator, three. I believe Senator Gaida has a, has a question. Senator Gaida. You know, I got to put you on full screen. There we are. Senator Gaida. Equally electronically challenged. I'm sorry. If I may, uh, to the sponsor, uh, Senator Waters, in the bill, uh, you speak to the ability of DES to accept funds from various sources. 
uh, presumably federally, I would imagine, uh, being the majority. Uh, do you at any point see this evolving to the point where it might engage uh, the necessity for general fund or other state raised funding? Well, this is for special purposes. Um, and so I, I don't think that this is a, this would ever be a location for that. I mean, obviously the state budget, you know, funds DES, right? Um, so this is, uh, you know, particular, the, the, this is a, a fund that is limited not to, not to those programs and not to general fund. I suppose if the general fund decided to want to throw something in there, it could, but that's not how it's set up to function. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing none. All right, we'll move forward. Uh, I believe Senator Waters has part two through part six as well. Yeah. So Senator Waters, if you're ready. I am ready and uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, again, this may look, this will certainly look familiar to um, Senator Guida. Um, this bill part two was establishing a statewide solid waste disposal uh, reduction goal. As I said, it is a, a bill that uh, got tied up in COVID last year. Um, and uh, so here it is again. Um, what this bill does is it gets New Hampshire uh, to plan for solid waste um, reduction over the next 10 years. There's some history about this. You might hear from the department that we had back in the 90s established a plan and uh, there really was not sufficient um, staffing and funding in DES in the early 2000s to keep the plan operational. And it really, in some ways, went into abeyance. Uh, there's been a feeling that we really need to get a handle on solid waste in, this, in the state. Uh, there are growing issues about the amount of waste that's coming into our landfills. They're filling up. And um, this is creating difficulties. Uh, also, the uh, difficulties with the recycling market over the last couple of years has meant that it's more difficult for uh, municipalities to find uh, places to take some of that recycling. And so some of it may be going up to the landfills. And, um, you know, we heard over the last couple of years, um, particularly on the commissioned to study solid waste that uh, Representative Ebel headed up in the House um, a couple of years ago from municipalities that were facing dramatic increases in their tipping fees. And I'll just say uh, from, my from Dover that the price of one of the bags that you put out, the Dover trash bags, has gone up uh, from about $1.90 each to about $3.90 each because of the tipping fee. Uh, going going up um, on this, and you know we're hearing it from all of our towns and communities. So what the bill is intended uh, to do, and as it had worked out very closely with DES, with Casella, with waste management, with municipalities last year, is to um, set us on a path uh, toward solid waste re reduction um, by creating this um, ten year ten year ten year plan. And so um, you'll see that it uh, lays out um, goals uh, to reduce by 25%. I'm on to page four now by 2030 and 45% by uh, 2050. These are numbers that DES um, recommended and dates that they recommended as well. And then importantly, following that, uh, following that on lines uh, eight um, moving forward, um, it offers some definitions of what solid waste is being looked at. And this uh, involved very close recommendation from Casella, from waste management, uh, from various industries um, who noted that it was not appropriate to include certain categories of, of waste, which are handled in special ways. So that's why you're gonna see that uh, list there. And then on, in this planning, uh, it makes reference to the hierarchy uh, established in RSA 149M3. And that's a hierarchy that lays out the best ways to, um, to handle uh, waste um, re reduction. Um, and uh, then um, it uh, suggests that uh, starting next year, 
um, that there be these uh, biannual updates on how um, this was this is going, and that um, and I think we may on line 32 want to change that date to 2022 because of where we are in the year. Um, so beginning October 1st, 2022, and every 10 years thereafter, the department shall update the plan over overall. Um, I would like to mention a couple of, uh, of things. Um, in the House, and I think we'll hear this from uh, Representative Ebel, uh, in the House there uh, is a bill that is on consent. Um, I believe it's House Bill 413, which is going to uh, set up a um, solid waste uh, committee that is supposed to look and work very closely with the DES on various strategies. So Chairman Ebel, uh, excuse me, Representative Ebel and I um, saw these bills really working in tandem. That that task force that's being set up can work very closely with um, DES to help in the development of this plan. And uh, so that's, that's, and I think if Representative Ebel has, has been able to be here, um, she plans to speak to, to that. Um, so um, that's, the, that's the bill and uh, you have um, a letter from DES uh, about it. Um, and I hope that well, the committee will look favorably upon it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're very welcome. Uh, Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes, Chair, thank you. Thank you, Senator Waters. Is the intention that um, if enacted, this bill would enable municipalities to directly take actions? It, it seems to imply that, but um, you know, in order to reduce waste generated within their jurisdiction? Yeah, that, that really cuts right to the key here is the municipalities are, are really um, facing, and the taxpayers are facing escalating costs here. And um, so the plan certainly is going to look at ways to help municipalities do that. We have the New England Recycling uh, Management Group, uh, NERA, I think it's called, which um, is, offers a lot of help and grants to municipalities um, to set up recycling programs to buy equipment for for that. Um, and uh, I do think that the plan in establishing a hierarchy and these goals, so what it's going to get at is how do we do source reduction, right? I mean, that's in, in all kinds of ways. How can we help communities and consumers reduce the amount that is coming into our landfills? Um, I think we're going to see some good news in some ways. Um, you know, the, the uh, J Main paper mill has been purchased by a foreign company that is uh, building a state-of-the-art uh, pulp, uh, excuse me, um, fiber recycling facility there. And so in terms of having a market where municipalities will be able to send some of that materials, which we hadn't, haven't had very, very well. And there's lots and lots of activity on the, on the side of plastics and glass as well uh, to find a way that um, materials recycling facilities uh, can produce uh, materials that, that then there will be a market for and municipalities can start making some money on again. Um, so complicated picture, but I, I think that your question is right to the point, how we're going to help our municipalities out. Thank you. Any further questions from the committee? Seeing none. Senator Waters. Okay, um, colleagues, uh, here we go into the amendment <laughs> parts of this. And um, you should have uh, before you an amendment dated February 24th, uh, and it's amendment 0501S. So uh, if you're able to pull that up, I'm sorry for others who are watching the hearing who may, may or may not, I'm not sure Griffin, what you can do about this, have access uh, to, this, to this amendment. Um, uh, Senator, if it's all right, if you would just, if I could ask you to pause, I can certainly put that amendment on screen real quick. Yeah, all right, one second. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Griffin. Um, this There's a lot of detail in here. And uh, so I'm gonna, and I know this is gonna provoke a lot of discussion by people who wanna testify. Um, so I will try to 
take a very fairly high overview of what the bill does. Um, essentially, it's trying to uh, address potential sources of PFAS contamination by doing a few things. Um, basically, there's three parts to this. Uh, aside from some general language about PFAS and why we need to, um, when appropriate, those sources that are can cause harm. Of course, not all of PFAS causes harm, but the sources uh, of it that that can that we 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 have some kind of way of protecting uh, New Hampshire families uh, uh, from it. Um, so there are three parts. Um, one part is dealing with uh, firefighting foam um, and its incineration. Um, this is something that has been a source of much discussion, ongoing concerns about, in, about incineration and deposition of the chemicals because of St. Gobain. Uh, and um, there, has been, there have been efforts made to put, put scrubbers and to deal with it there. And I'm sure DES can um, address that. But I thought that we, that we needed to legislatively to have some guidance and some assurance for the public about how this process of incineration would be transparent to them. I will note as well that we have a fair amount of um, PFAS uh, firefighting, foam, firefighting foam chemicals that are now currently being stored around the states at fire departments and elsewhere because we don't have a place to dispose of them. There was some hope that they might go to an incinerator that was accepting these materials over in Copake, New York, and that has not worked out. So what the bill, um, this part of the bill says is that if the state cannot find a location out of state to incinerate these, that if they're incinerated in the state, then um, DES needs to determine that it can be done without a threat to public health or the environment and report such findings to all local governments and state agencies. I do think there's gonna be some interest here in adding some language that that finding uh, includes a process for public uh, comment. And then aside from the firefighting foam, part three, line 21 there in the amendment um, says that if other kinds of PFAS containing waste, um, leachate and sludge are likely to be larger issues coming down the road, same thing. If they're gonna be incinerated some verification that they're not going to pose a threat to public health environment and that um, that is communicated to local um, governments. Um, the second part of the bill uh, deals with PFAS in food packaging. Uh, this is emerging as a very significant uh, issue um, that if there is PFAS that can leach out of the packaging materials into the food stuff potentially, or if these food packaging then end up in the waste stream and have the potential for reaching out and, and causing threats to human health, then we ought to find a way to get on a course to eliminate them. So you have some definitions of uh, PFAS uh, here and some definitions of uh, food packaging. And the bill then lays out um, a process whereby the manufacturers of the food packaging will report to the DES um, that this present is here. And then over a certain period of time, there will be an effort to eliminate those when feasible, you know, when possible, eliminate those from uh, food, food packaging. There is a national organization, the Biogradable Products Institute. And it is a place that any manufacturer can go and ask to have its packaging certified as biodegradable. If your packaging is certified as such by that national group, then this won't apply to you. This also affects later on when we get to composting. Um, and, you know, composting, a lot of folks want to use the composted material. Composting is good for reducing the, the waste um, flows we were just talking about. Same thing. If it's certified by this group, then it's good. Then it would be good, good to go. I mentioned this is a particularly timely issue because some people may have seen in reports over the last couple of weeks that Ahold Del Hayes 
Um, you probably don't know that name, but they are one of the largest manufacturers of food uh, packaging in the country. They do the Hannaford brands, for example, and I'm sure we all know Hannaford's in, in New Hampshire. They have determined that there is a substantial threat to human health from PFAS in food packaging. And so they are committed to remove it entirely from food packaging in all their products. And I suspect that we will see this uh, being adopted by other folks in the, in, in the industry. So I think that what we'd be doing in this bill then is get New Hampshire where, where it ought to be um, as this increasing recognition of in food packaging that this is just not an appropriate chemicals um, to have. Um, then the third part uh, of, of the bill um, looks more generally at uh, plastics and uh, PFAS in materials um, that may potenti a, uh, potentially pr present a threat. So on page three of the amendment, um, you see some findings about plastics, microplastics. I'm particularly concerned about that because the Commission on uh, Coastal Marine Resources and environment has uh, spent about six or eight months hearing research reports about how these microfibers from plastics in the ocean are showing up uh, in shellfish and in fin fish and being consumed. And now they're finding them um, not only in human bodies because of this food consumption, but also in utero. Um, so it seemed to me that it would be reasonable to ask the um, the DES to create a report on plastics. And this is on page four, um, that the department would consider emerging scientific research on health, human health and environmental effects, including effects on animal and aquatic species of plastics and ways to reduce or eliminate single use plastics and plastic waste that cause adverse effects. They don't have to do their own research, consult, consult available studies it is necessary to work with DHHS and Fish and Game and other interested parties and uh, would report by December 1st, 2022. Now, the last part of the bill um, kind of is connected to the second um, part uh, in terms of, you know, just noting what kinds of um, PFAS ought to be covered by other statute that uh, look at toxic and hazardous materials. Um, so what this uh, section of the bill on pages four uh, and, and five, and including the, the, um, the uh, composting here, um, is just to uh, say that um, unless it's, again, unless it's BPI certified, that then it is listed as something that is regulated like we regulate other uh, toxic materials and other toxic uh, matters as, as well. Um, you know, like we regulate mercury, for e example. Um, and the, the, so this last section of this uh, goes through those various um, statutes uh, where we list these other potentially hazardous materials and just the PFAS that has not been BPI certified, it ought to be included in these parts of state statute as well. So um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. There it is. Okay, so are there any questions from the committee on this amendment? Not all at once. All right, let's move right along. Then we'll... Uh... Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so part four um, is a bill that uh, is meant to enable New Hampshire to be at the ready if, for zoonotic disease transmission. And zoonotic diseases are diseases that can uh, be trans that can leap from um, animal wild animal species into uh, into humans. And uh, I guess we've been hearing a lot about that over the last uh, 14 months, haven't we? Um, so this uh, a bill, like 
similar efforts in other states is undertaken to make sure that we have the kind of tools, the kind of an early warning system. So if, if we need to do something uh, about this, that we'll be ready um, to do it. I wanna say um, at the start here, I wanna give thanks to um, Director Mason of Fish and Game, to Paul Sanderson of Fish and Game, and um, to Commissioner Jasper of the Department of Agriculture. Uh, we worked a lot on early drafts of this bill. And the one you see before you is one that um, everybody involved agreed that make, makes some sense and uh, that they, they felt that this was, this was the, uh, an acceptable way um, to go. So um, you get some definitions of um, zoonotic uh, diseases, um, referencing to wildlife trafficking and trade. We dealt with this a couple years ago in some bills that we needed to pass on wildlife trafficking in the, in the, in the state. And um, so uh, this, you know, recognizes that that is a potential um, problem that we have to keep an eye on. And then in part three on line 16, and again, I'm on the amendment here, um, that uh, New Hampshire needs to prepare for the emergency management of novel zoonotic pathogens that may threaten public health, food security, biological diversity, and economic um, security. So um, what the bill um, does is that it uh, says, and again, this isn't, you know, this is one of those ones where there is some federal statute here, but the feds don't enforce it in the state. Um, so this is why starting on line 20, prohibited import of animals and fish, risk of zoonotic disease transmission. Uh, the Fish and Games Department shall monitor available information. And that's important. They don't have to go out and do a lot of research here. It's just to you know, keep apprised of what we're hearing from national organizations and from the federal government about animals and fish not currently restricted under state and federal wildlife trafficking laws. Those, those what are, uh, existing lists tend to deal with endangered species, not other wildlife species that may uh, have zoonotic disease transmission. And then if they're transported in a state, will risk zoonotic disease transposition. The department can consult with HHS, state veterinarian, and others uh, in, in uh, gathering that information. And then um, if it comes to their attention that we need to do something, make some recommendations, um, to the legislature on any legislation or rules needed on this importer restrictions. And then if we get into an emergency situation to re tell the governor, request to the governor that emergency order uh, might be needed. The, the next part of the bill uh, going on to page two uh, deals with live animal markets. And again, I don't need to remind us of why we have some concern about live animal uh, markets. And here, as appropriate to New Hampshire, um, it gives the Department of Fish and Game a, a way to keep an eye on this. Uh, some definitions, definition of taxon. Um, and I have one slight correction to make on lines nine and 10. Um, the determination, I say, as uh, determined by the Fish and Game Commission, I had meant it should be there as determined by the director of the department, as determined by the director of the department. That's just such a, that's the appropriate way to do, um, to do this. Um, and then uh, on the operation of these uh, markets, um, you know, quite appropriately uh, says, no animal should be offered for sale at a live animal market that is of a taxon known or likely to be responsible for zoonotic transmission of diseases. So here's your bats and, uh, other potential wildlife. Um, but again, the director gets to, to make that, that call. Um, and then wildlife species that are already identified and known likely um, shouldn't be caged, handled, transported with livestock or domestic animals, where obviously they could, you know, that disease could make that uh, leap. Um, and uh, then, um, the, you know, that they should not be in live animal markets or wild, live wildlife uh, market. And then specif specifies, um, because the federal wildlife trafficking statutes um, do deal with endangered species, that there are the species that ought not to, you know, that are zoonotic at risk of transmission and ought not to be um, 
here, bats, rodents, primate species. Um, there may be others, but that's those are the, the key ones. Um, and then um, fish and game can, uh, excuse me, healthy observers can adopt some rules if needed um, that would uh, follow on to that, uh, those provisions about um, storing and sale of animals. Um, and then importantly at the bottom of page two, are the exceptions. Um, this is not about our current livestock markets um, that are allowed under New Hampshire law. It's not about seafood or shellfish markets um, that offer live seafood or shellfish for under, under law. Um, so important exclusions there because we're not going after those things, we're going after the things that are a risk uh, to people. And then uh, at the end, the penalties, uh, a written warning, uh, and then a class B misdemeanor for sub subsequent. Um, so thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's, there's a little bit of public safety and public health. Thank you, Senator. Are there any questions from the committee members? All right, let's move on. Okay, and um, I'm not sure whether we got an amendment in time for this, Griffin, did we? Yes, we do. I'm putting it on screen right now. Uh, thank you so much. I think it's what I have to speak from. Um, <clears throat> so let me just give you a little bit of background here. Um, you've been hearing us folks along the seacoast uh, talk about nitrogen and permitting for wastewater treatment plants for years now uh, because of the, the Great Bay and because of the EPA pushing and pushing and pushing municipalities uh, to do more and more. And um, I will say that, you know, one of my first bills in the Senate, what, uh, you know, nine years ago now, was to try to push back on the EPA because these communities felt they hadn't used uh, good science. And it turned out after we did that bill that, yeah, we were, we were right. So this is a long standing issue of making sure that the EPA understands our particular estuary. <clears throat> and adopts rules and permits that are appropriate to it. The communities around the Great Bay, Rochester, Dover, Exeter, Newmarket, uh, Portsmouth have spent hundreds of millions of dollars upgrading their wastewater treatment plants. All the communities share the goal of cleaning up the Great Bay and the associated rivers. The last couple of years, the EPA has been coming forward now with new permitting for these plants. And the fear was that, you know, they only can regulate what they can regulate. And the plants are producing maybe 40% of the nitrogen that goes in there and the rest is from runoff and other non-point sources that um, the municipalities had hammered to a complete unreasonable degree and do things that were beyond, really beyond technology and would cost again, hundreds of millions of dollars more on top of what's already spent. So an agreement was worked out with the EPA last year on these permits that enabled municipalities to look kind of globally at all these sources and try to reduce them from, from all kinds of places and not just by spending money on their plants, which are already, I think, doing an awfully good job. And one um, piece, a detail related to this is that we need to update this definition of surface waters and what is being counted as acceptable. This would be an important tool for anybody facing MS4 or nitrogen permitting um, to in their negotiations with the EPA about what levels they have to meet and how and where those levels get measured. So this was brought um, forward um, from the uh, waste uh, Water Managers Association in, in the state, and it just offers a technical uh, definition in title waters about what standard we are using, not exceed a geometric mean, most probable number, MPN of 14 organisms per 100 milliliters for fecal coliform, um, and, and so on. Uh, and uh, this will protect our shellfish. That's an off, you know, the, the aquaculture 
program in the Great Bay and the, and the 44 now folks who are in business in agriculture in the Great Bay and the Hampton and Seabrook Estuary, great business. You know, we love the oysters and, and, and so forth. A lot of potential there for mussels as well. That um, this will make sure they are protected. They're good with it, as DES will tell you, but it will use an appropriate measure for us in our work with the, with the EPA. So that is that one, Mr. Chairman. Wonderful. Thank you, Senator. I, I hold you in great admiration for going through all these bills. You do yeah, a well. I feel a little dizzy myself, but the, I'm not going to take your silence as absolute consent either, colleagues. So I won't dream. I won't dream on. But I'm going to. I'm going to be hopeful and go on now to part, part six. Uh, I'm absorbing it all. But before we go any further, uh, are there any questions? All right. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> there might be questions of whether you'll get a coherent answer. It's going to be another <laughs> another issue at this point. Um, so, as they say, moving right along. Um, part six um, um, deals with the issue of derelict uh, fishing gear. And um, the hazard for many reasons. Again, this bill will be familiar to um, Senator Guida. Uh, we've had it before us last time, got a whole lot of support, and uh, then then COVID came along. Um, what, is, what it is trying to do is to deal with derelict fishing gear um, uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, one is because the derelict fishing gear can be the source of, of ocean plastics, um, you know, whether it's the net or plastics coming off the uh, traps or, uh, or other, other sources. And um, so if there are ways that we can encourage the cleanup of this derelict fishing gear, that'll keep those um, plastics from getting into the ecosystem. And then secondly, uh, this derelict fishing gear can become a navigation and a fishing hazard. That because of the operation of the ocean, sometimes you get these huge balls of uh, traps and nets and, and things and they can uh, affect navigational channels. Um, and uh, also they can of course affect fishing, uh, fishing folks who wanna get their gear, uh, gear down there. Um, there has been a voluntary, there is a voluntary program, which is um, quite effective. We're going to hear about that from Fish and Game, um, in which there is a, a derelict fishing gear cleanup event, um, and they, you know, bring in dumpsters, and uh, it is it is collected off the beaches and elsewhere. Um, you know, there's some potential for some dive teams getting involved and pulling some of those large masses off the ocean floor as well. And those can be collected. And then there is a recycling program down in Massachusetts and uh, the bins can be uh, transported down, down there. Um, it's an effective and a useful program. It's been, it's been grant funded, um, but that grant funding is uncertain as uh, in, in future, uh, future years. Um, secondly, there is um, an ex existing uh, program on um, you know, gear to energy where there are uh, a couple of dumpsters that are available for fishermen and they can um, put their derelict gear in there and then it goes off to that same, same facility and uh, they, they transfer this uh, into energy and, and recycling and, and, and so forth. Um, the issue here is sustaining those programs. And so what uh, this um, bill does is that it says that people who are in those fisheries that are responsible for the derelict fishing gear will be asked to pay a surcharge on their licensing. Now you will see if you read it carefully that it is set up so that if you participate in one of these events, you don't pay, you don't pay. Um, so if you just, you know, certify the director, hey, I was there last, you know, I was there last, last spring, last fall, you know, whenever the event was held and I walked the beach and, you know, helped haul things up and, or I brought some of my gear in, um, you're good to go. The effect will be that since we have a lot of out-of-state license holders, I suspect that those will be the folks who end up um, paying this. And the bill sets up a fund so that we'll be able to continue um, these program. It's the director that um, gets to determine that amount, not more than 25 uh, nor less than $10, which, uh, you know, in talking with the fishing community seemed to be a reasonable um, number. 
Uh, much of this bill did come out of that Commission on Marine and Natural Resources and actually was a kind of suggestion of uh, Eric Anderson, who uh, represents the fishing industry on that, 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 that group. Um, and then it also uh, includes derelict fishing gear um, uh, fine collection uh, under the litter laws, this is existing law, that if you're collecting fines in that program for derelict litter, littering in coastal waters or beaches and abandoned fishing gear, that that'll go into this fund, which is appropriate because that's, you know, it's the plastics, you know, there's somebody writ has written a ticket for, you know, littering on the beach and that's what the beach cleanup has to deal with and that fine probably ought to go uh, into this into this fund. So the bill goes through each of the um, appropriate licenses uh, for it. And um, then it sets up a fishing for energy fund uh, as established on the um, last, uh, last, last part there. And um, that's, that's, that's what that's what it does. So there you have it, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you, Senator. Uh, are there any questions from the committee members? <coughs> Excuse me. Seeing none, all right. We will move right along to section seven, I believe. Yep, so Senator, we have Senator Bradley here to speak to his portion of the bill. Uh, thank you, Senator Waters. And now Senator Bradley, uh, welcome and uh, the floor is yours. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I will be very brief. Um, this is a constituent request. I filed this bill and I agree with a constituent who believes that we should be prioritizing as part of the land and community um, investment program, the preservation of farmland, agricultural land that could be used for agricultural purposes in New Hampshire as part of LCHIP. I think that um, given some of the vagaries of the world, as we know it, the ability to grow food in the state of New Hampshire should become a priority. I chose to uh, not make it a mandate, but rather put it in the purpose statement of um, RSA 227M1, um, where it would be adjudicated, if you will, by the board that makes decisions on uh, what land or cultural resources to um, protect. Subsequent to that, I learned from Commissioner Jasper that he requested $250,000 in the second year of his budget for farmland acquisition and preservation, which I think is great. Um, and in fact, may well do much more for the goal that I've articulated in this bill than doing it in the way I've suggested. So, um, you know, I commend it to you. I, I know that there'll be some testimony ex raising some questions, if you will, by uh, Land and Community Heritage Board members. Um, I think those are appropriate questions. Um, perhaps this section of the bill could be, if not passed, uh, retained for further study just to ensure that uh, the $250,000 request survives in the budget. Needless to say, the goal that um, my constituent, whose name is uh, Rebecca Swafield, articulated, I think is a very valuable long-term goal that should be encouraged. So happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Senator, for the testimony. Uh, Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Bradley. I think you mostly addressed my question, but um, I had also heard from some members of the LCHIP program, which, as you know, was a legacy of my predecessor, Senator Fuller Clark. Um, and so, you know, it, it seems to them that targeting farmland is already well within their statutory purview and that they can focus on that. So, I was going to ask if you were open to some changes in the bill, but um, so it sounds like at this time, your recommendation is essentially that as a committee, we might 
um, re refer this part of the bill, but I don't know that we can divide the questioning committee. So I just wondered whether you might be open to a committee amendment to remove this section. Is there another procedural way we could retain the two hundred? Well, really, yeah, and, and I appreciate it. And I um, going back to when Senator Fuller Clark. Um, was the prime sponsor of the LCHIP bill. I was one of the co-sponsors. So I've long been a supporter of, of LCHIP. I'm not sure that there is a procedural way to um, save this um, if it were dropped from the bill. Um, I'm not gonna suggest a study committee either. <laughs> I, I would just hope that um, if this provision's not gonna go forward, that we really make sure that the $250,000 that um, is in the governor's budget, the commissioner Jasper um, asked for, rightfully so, um, is protected in the budget process. And, you know, this section of um, Senate Bill 146 and the budget are pretty independent of each other. So at any rate, I think that when you hear from, um, the director, uh, Digit Taylor, who I think has done a really good job, as have the LCHIP board and center guide is on it. Um, I understand the concerns. I was trying, again, not to make this a mandate, but just a preference. If there's a way to write that in a way that doesn't um, upend, you know, some of the other valid considerations of LCHIP, I'd be all, f I'd be in favor of that too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Any uh, more questions from the committee? Seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. So next up, Senator, we have Senator Perkins Cuoco to introduce her section of the bill. Senator Perkins Cuoco, you are recognized. <laughs> so you do. Uh, good afternoon, committee members. For the record, I am Senator Rebecca Perkins Quoka from Senate District 21, representing Portsmouth and the towns of Madbury, Lee, Durham, Newington, Newmarket, and Newfields. I'm the prime sponsor of Part 8 of SB 146. Part 8 is an attempt to advance New Hampshire's renewable energy goals by increasing the demand for renewable energy projects in New Hampshire. It has the added effect of supporting the private market for renewable energy credits, known as RECs, by ensuring that the standards at least reflect the reality on the ground in our state, which at this time is 1% solar energy, and thus create stability in the prices for RECs. This is a gradual process proposed in the bill, increasing the class two percentage by less than 1% every year until 2025 for class two only. Part eight builds on the progress made in 2017's SB 129, which was the last time the RPS was altered. I'll leave it there, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the opportunity to present and I'm happy to answer any questions from the committee. Well done, Senator, thank you. Um, any questions from the committee? Senator Waters, you are recognized. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Senator, for your uh, testimony. And um, so it's your sense that this um, will do a couple of things that it really is, we have, an, it, we have a really um, fast developing solar industry in the state, lots of jobs potentially there. And that if we, so it would be that if we had some, some good state assurance here, there'd be some assurance for those investors and municipalities who wanna get a, to do this, that, uh, that this would be a, a, a shared goal of the state. Is that part of it? Yeah, exactly, Senator, thank you. Um, part of the what the RPS goals do, and again, this is just part of it, is to help provide a market for these renewable energy credits, which essentially acts as an additional um, asset that a developer could sell and still provides an additional income stream to renewable energy projects, which, um, you know, in turn just makes them more financeable and again, just creates a more stable regulatory environment for renewables to flourish in. And if I may follow up, Mr. Chairman. Um, and, uh, you know, the importance of RECs uh, and having a, a good market for RECs extends um, to lots of our things we're trying to accomplish with renewable energy. And uh, besides, now I, should, I suppose for full disclosure, I should mention, I'm getting some RECs for my, for my the solar on top of my house as I think about it, um, you know, and that won't be much money, but there, there it is. And that uh, by having a healthy market for 
Rex, we essentially um, help uh, renewable energy developers of all kinds. Is, is that the case? Yep, different classes um, will affect different types of projects, but exactly, you know, this program has been successful because it's essentially allowed the private market to, to act as an encouragement um, to renewables development. And so, as you mentioned, from little to big, <laughs> you know, I think it's it's been successful in just providing stability and um, and sort of added revenue to projects, which in New Hampshire, just given the price of energy um, is needed in many cases to make the projects financeable. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next section and we recognize, I believe Senator Waters again. Yes, uh, thank you. I'm standing in for uh, Senator Sherman, who uh, was unable to attend uh, today. Um, this section is a technical correction. Uh, back in 1999, um, the Supreme Court in William Purdue versus, excuse me, William Purdy versus the Attorney General overturned the definition of the high water mark uh, in in the matter that is noted in the bill, so that it strips out what had been the um, definition of the high, the high water mark um, that the Supreme Court overturned and then substitutes for that the language that the judge approved, the average height of all the high waters over a complete tidal cycle commonly referred to as the mean high tide line. So, um, you know, having that defined appropriate state statute is important and that having that mean high tide line, anybody who's served on zoning will tell you is an, and planning is an important thing to have defined. So this gets our statute into, uh, into sync with what the um, Supreme Court says it ought to be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator. Any questions from the committee? I see none. So let's move on. Uh, section nine. Well, that was section nine. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Section nine. Did I mess up there? No, I messed up. Section right. eight, section nine. So, Senator uh, Avard, at this point, I believe Senator Waters, Senator Bradley, Senator Perkins Quoka have introduced their respective parts of the bill. So now what we would do is we would return to the top, to part one, and allow individuals to testify on part one. Once everybody finishes testifying, we move on to part two, and we continue that process all the way down. Um, um, so Jenny, I, Jenny, I think, will be uh, the warden, I guess you could say, in um, identifying people to speak and giving and reminding them of a three-minute time limit to speak. All right, Jenny, you have the floor. All right, so everybody that is looking to speak on part one of the bill, if you could please raise your hands, we'll be happy to call on you and give you about three minutes um, that we're hoping you can respect in terms of offering testimony. So for part one of the bill, we have one hand up. It's Steve Cotre, oh, a couple more. So we'll start with Steve. Steve, you can go ahead and identify yes. yourself for the record. Yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for the early release by the warden. Uh, I'll be brief uh, in my testimony on SB, S, SB 146, part one, uh, establishing the coastal program and state statute. Senator Waters did an excellent job uh, or providing an overview of the coastal program. Uh, you should have a couple enclosures that came with the letter of testimony, one being kind of an overview of the coastal program and some of the activities we done in the past, and then also a map just showing the communities that we primarily work with uh, in coastal New Hampshire. So DES requested this bill uh, a year ago, as Senator Waters mentioned, we already had a hearing last year. Uh, and again, we are supportive of this bill. And the, the one change from last year that I'll highlight to finish my testimony is the federal consistency provision that uh, enables the coastal program to uh, to have New Hampshire's voice in federal actions um, is critically important, especially with the uptick in the potential offshore wind industry and the uses that we have in the offshore. Uh, the Attorney General's office has uh, made it clear to us that without uh, having the coastal program and state statute that that federal consistency provision could be challenged in court and we might have um, some difficulty uh, defending it. So. 
That's a change from last year. We thought that was the case, but it has been confirmed in this one year lag uh, since last year. Uh, and with that, um, again, I'll emphasize that DES uh, requested and supports uh, this legislation, part one, and uh, open to any questions. Questions from the committee? Thank you very much, Steve. I see none. Uh, so we'll move on to our next. All right, we're gonna move on to Susan Richmond. Ms. Richmond, if you could just identify yourself for the record. Uh, yes, I'm Susan Richmond, a private citizen uh, in Durham, New Hampshire. And um, thank you so much for taking my testimony and thank you for this elegant bill that cleans up all sorts of little loose ends. Uh, so we have all these studies and recommendations and the coastal, uh, seven years ago, the Coastal Risks and Hazards Commission wrote about all the threats to coastal land and we seem to always respond to them on a case by case basis. And oh my God, there's been an emergency. And this simply says, you know, we're experiencing greater weather events, sea level rise, let's just be planful. So, um, and again, this like so many elements in this omnibus bill takes the onus off the local community and says the state has guidelines and that the state can give some advice and help. So thank you. and I'm speaking in support of SB 146. Any questions from the committee? Thank you very much, seeing none. Okay, that appears to be everyone that we have on part one of the bill. So we'll move on to part two of the bill. If you're looking to testify, if you could please raise your hand. If you could also follow the very good example of staying under three minutes that has been set so far. Uh, we would certainly appreciate it. We're going to start with my uh, Representative Abel. Representative, you should be good to go. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Karen Abel here. I represent uh, Merrimack District 5, which is New London and Newbury, and I'm here to testify in support of um, Part 2 of SB 146. As Senator Waters said, this is basically the same bill that was introduced uh, last year in the Senate. It was unanimously recommended by this committee and um, did get tied up in COVID. Um, he, uh, the Senator also mentioned that I was the chair of the um, of the Recycling and Waste Stream Study Committee back in 2019. Um, as you'll recall, in mid-2019, China decided to stop taking solid waste from the US where it had been recycled, particularly plastics and mixed paper. This put a tremendous uh, strain on our cities and towns, on their pocketbooks. And because of that, I introduced HB 617 um, the committee's goal was to hear from as many stakeholder groups as possible, public and private landfill operators, municipalities, schools, recyclers. And what followed really was an extraordinary um, experience. We had an eight week study and we had 14 hearings and over 50 stakeholders participated. What resulted was a comprehensive, comprehensive study committee report. And in the uh, information that I sent to you, you'll find a link there so you can look at it. Um, if you are working on solid waste and you haven't had a chance to look at it, I hope you'll be able to because it really summarizes um, a lot of what we're facing here in the state. We, in short, we um, have a lot of problems as far as our solid waste streams are uh, concerned, COVID stalled our efforts, but the situation is only getting, getting worse, starting with a brewing crisis in our landfill capacity and the extraordinarily limited capacity of the DES Solid Waste Bureau to deal with uh, more day-to-day -day responsibilities due to drastic budget cuts. The study committee made many recommendations, but among the most important was what uh, you see embodied in this bill, and that is redefining our solid waste disposal goal, uh, which is 20 years past due and really isn't workable. And the recasting of our state solid waste plan and changing the reporting period. It's difficult to express how important this is to every resident and entity in this state. We all consume many products and we all generate waste. 
Our municipalities, businesses, and our state must handle that waste. That costs time and money, and we're short on both. Um, Senator Waters did uh, mention that I have another bill that was an outgrowth of the Recycling Committee, which just was uh, unanimously recommended by, by our um, Environment and Agriculture Committee and is on the consent calendar. It's HB 413. Representative. And what that would do would be- Representative. Yeah. I'm very sorry, but um, that's been okay. the three minutes. So if you could very quickly wrap it up. Um, okay. Uh, I mean, basically, what we really need to do is focus in on our uh, on our solid waste issues, and we need to support DES's Solid Waste Bureau to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Thank you. Senator Waters, with a question. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Representative. Thanks so much for for being here. I know you had a lot of meetings and a busy day. And um, I just, I'll, I know the time is short, but I just wanted to, to note that in my comments on HB 13, I, uh, 413, I suggested that that would be a very good um, place to work in tandem to help the DES in this longer range planning by suggesting strategies and definitions and pro processes. Is that, is that, was that correct to Put yeah, that that's way. that's correct. Unfortunately, because of the time, I, I wasn't able to uh, to get to that. But the bill is pretty comprehensive in identifying the things mm. that we need to discuss to develop um, a diversion plan for our solid waste, so we can uh, conserve the solid the uh, landfill capacity that we do have. And one of the things we have to zero in on uh, is the fact that we currently take in a lot of out-of-state waste. Um, we can't limit that under the interstate commerce clause, but we also have to keep an eye on um, protecting our own residents and our own capacity. So source reduction and different ways of recycling are really important to discuss to, to support the plan. If I just one quick follow up, uh -huh. uh, Karen. And so my representation that the timing, the timeline for House Bill 413 works out just right um, with the time, the timing for the creation of this um, plan for DES. Yes, that's correct. And, and uh, I talked to DES about how all that would uh, dovetail together. So that would work well. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions from the committee? Seeing none. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. Okay, next up we have Mark Morgan. Good afternoon, committee. Thank you for, for taking my, my testimony. Um, I'm the solid waste manager for the city of Lebanon. And at this facility, we do um, own and operate a, uh, a, a uh, aligned landfill facility as well as recycling and compost operation. We provide services to 22 communities throughout the Upper Valley in both New Hampshire and Vermont. Um, my testimony is in support of this bill, uh, absolutely. Um, I was pleased to see the change in the waste reduction to moving away from increasing a recycling rate to addressing um, disposal weights. It's a, it's a more clear cut way to identify waste reduction um, and helps plan for the future. As mentioned earlier, House Bill 413 um, could be a huge help in, I, in accomplishing these waste reduction goals. It'll help determine a pathway uh, for the state of New Hampshire. As mentioned earlier, one of the critical needs um, in New Hampshire is identifying um, resource needs at New Hampshire Department of Environmental Services. Um, this bill has a lot of additional responsibilities at the department that's already straining with, uh, with resource needs. So it's, it's my hope that as we move forward, we identify those needs and make necessary changes. The second part of my testimony is in reference to section three of part two uh, in relation to solid waste planning in New Hampshire. Um, I am actually a solid waste planner by trade. I worked at New Hampshire DES for a number of years as a solid waste planner before the section focusing on solid waste planning was um, dissolved. Um, Solid waste planning for New Hampshire is critical and is grossly absent at this time. Um, 
I'm concerned at the amount of time being 10 years for solid waste planning in between evaluating options uh, for New Hampshire. It's currently at six years and the 10 year gap uh, troubles me. And just as a, a point of note, um, in the past 10 years, some of the things we've seen, um, our neighbors to the south have changed the way they landfill waste, which has driven a lot of waste north into New Hampshire. Vermont has had a number of uh, legislative changes in their state as well, also impacting New Hampshire's um, disposal capacity. We've seen a waste energy plant right here in New Hampshire close, reducing our disposal capacity. Recycling markets have changed regionally, as was mentioned at the beginning, a number of paper plants have shut down. They're being reopened, but uh, they're being reopened very differently than they did um, over a decade ago. <coughs> mentioned earlier, global recycling markets are also changing and have been very dramatic in those changes affecting our state. Collection methods for recyclables have also changed. The idea of single stream recycling 10 years ago was, was virtually unheard of. It was only a handful of communities participating in that. Now it's the majority. Technology, techniques, and markets change rapidly. And again, I'm just concerned that a 10-year gap will miss some of those very complex um, and difficult um, changes to address. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I, any, yes, Senator Waters, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Morgan. And I know Lebanon's a real leader. Um, thank I, you. To address your point, I mean, the 10 years made a lot of sense to the DES, but please, does, does it make sense to you that since we have the, the every two years report that if issues are identified, that, that the legislature would be able to uh, take action if needed in, in, the, in, the, in the process here too. So um, just to say we understand, but that's you see what we're, to see the way we're trying to do it. Oh, I totally see the, the ability to catch up as we're going along. And I think, frankly, a 10-year plan would work if the resources were addressed at DES. So um, absolutely. I'm just looking at it as it stands today. And um, that would just be an enormous gap given the current resources at DES Waste Management Division. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? All right, Mark, uh, I, I may have a few. And uh, so I'm going to admit ignorance and I need a little education. Uh, with regards to the Interstate Commerce Clause, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Why, um, uh, what you, you mentioned is uh, that Mass is, uh, or our neighbors to the South, I don't know if it's Mass, but uh, our neighbors to the South, they're driving waste up into New Hampshire because they've changed their, um, their method of, of waste. So, you know, what is, can you elaborate a little bit on that? What, what's happening? So what the interstate commerce clause says is you can't say no to uh, interstate commerce. Waste and recycling are commerce. So you can't restrict that. What states can do is they can define how they will receive it. So a couple of examples, Massachusetts changed the way they allow construction and demolition debris to be disposed of in Massachusetts. They said no more unprocessed. That means whole raw job site waste. You know, if you do a remodel at your house, it all goes in a dumpster. That dumpster can no longer go directly to a landfill in Massachusetts. It has to go to a processor first to be source, not source reduced, but size reduced or pull out um, high value recyclables. Then it can be, then it's ground up and used as daily cover at a landfill, but it can't go unprocessed. So there's a high cost to that. New Hampshire doesn't have such a requirement. So uh, we're a lower cost option. So it's pushed waste into New Hampshire. Doesn't mean you can't send it to Massachusetts. It just means to send it there, there's certain things you need to do. Same in Vermont. Uh, for Vermont, a community has to have what's called a solid waste implementation plan from your community is one of the requirements. Other requirements include five household hazardous waste collections per year. Uh, and, and very often those requirements have limited out of state waste to go into that state. Um, so it's, there are techniques available that allow you to maintain compliance with interstate commerce clause in the constitution, but it's just finding those that work 
within our state and our communities that are acceptable. So how does this bill help us? So I think what this bill does is it really, it identifies the need, first of all, and for years that need has not been critically identified. The other way that it helps is it puts, um, it does put pressure on the issue. It's certainly getting attention. Um, you know, solid waste is something we all generate every day. But um, in my mind, it's a magical thing because you put it out at the end of the curb, it goes away. Um, so very often we ignore the problem because our trash just goes away. Well, it's getting to a point, as mentioned earlier by Senator Waters, that cost has gone up hundreds of percent in the last 10 years. Uh, as a result, it's starting to get people's attention. Um, before a dollar here, a dollar there didn't matter, but now communities paying three, four dollars a bag is starting to catch people's attention. It's not only the tip fee, but it's also the amount of mileage that our waste is traveling. So it's, it's not just a tip fee issue, it's also a transportation issue, which is an even larger issue that's driving these costs up. So um, I firmly believe that what this, this bill will do is help identify some of the, the barriers that currently exist in New Hampshire. My hope is, and forgive me, I'm gonna be blunt, is that our community, including our uh, representatives have the stomach to make some very hard decisions. Uh, New Hampshire does not have a mechanism to pay for some of these resources. And we're gonna have to have that very difficult discussion as to how we will pay for the resource needs identified in this bill. So if I may ask another question, and I'm sorry to hang you up here, um, but oh, no. with regards to uh, the fact that New Hampshire doesn't have the same uh, processing as, as the, the Massachusetts, uh, how has that uh, impacted our, our, our waste, uh, you know, our, uh, where we, we put our waste? Uh, I, it, they're using our facilities, basically. They're sending it up here and we can't refuse. By how much? How much is that, hurt? How much is that increasing our capacity or, or diminishing our capacity to address the, this uh, waste? So currently, uh, about half of the waste that's received in New Hampshire, I think it's like 49%. Um, is coming from out of state. Yikes. So, and a, and a large portion of that, and I could be very wrong in my percentage, but 70 to 75% is coming from Massachusetts. We just love our neighbors to the south. So I, uh, I mean, it's, I mean it's, it's a part of this business model. Waste is a regional commodity and very, you know, we send waste out of state as well. So, you know, as was mentioned earlier about the PFAS waste management options, you know, um, very often we're moving waste into areas where it's where it's more affordable um, because it's it can be a complicated and expensive material to manage. So just to repeat myself, which I'm really good at doing, this bill basically helps us to identify the problems that we're not addressing. That is my hope in this work, yes. And I think it's gonna be important for all those involved to have a serious look at the problems and issues and come up with some real world solutions. Some of it comes down to a lack of funding and how do you fund uh, some of these solutions? I think we need to recognize this is something that we need to address and address sooner than later um, is gonna be more beneficial. The further we kick this can down the road, the more expensive it's gonna get. And so my final question to you, if the committee has none, is basically uh, you said resources addressed to DC, uh, DES. Uh, what are we looking at as far as the shortage for uh, resources for DES? So as I mentioned, um, about 12 years ago, I worked for DES in a group called the Planning and Community Assistance Section. And our job was to do exactly all of this. Um, there was it was a five member group and we were non-regulatory. It was all technical assistance. We wrote the solid waste plan. Uh, we addressed waste reduction needs. I was actually the recycling coordinator for New Hampshire. So all of these issues that we're now um, picking back up were addressed at DES a number of years ago by um, in-house staff. So as far as resources go, it's really going to come down to bodies initially, but then maybe later it, come, it turns into uh, grants or other opportunities, but I think the first step is just restaffing the waste division um, 
for positions that are non-regulatory. Mark, I really appreciate your, uh, your testimony. Thank you very much. Any uh, committee members have any more questions? Seeing none, we'll move on to the next. Thank you, Jen. And next up we have Stephen Chingaris. Uh, good afternoon, uh, members of the committee, Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Steve Changaris. I'm the Northeast uh, Regional Vice President for the Solid Waste and Recycling Association, uh, the National Waste and Recycling Association. I've been doing this work for 29 years, um, and I'm grateful to have a few moments to um, support uh, part two of Senate Bill 146. We agree with the laudable goals of uh, the solid uh, of the of the plan reductions, the weight reductions, uh, by twenty five percent in nine years and forty percent, forty five percent by uh, twenty fifty. Uh, we appreciate those goals. We think they're realistic and aspirational at the same time, and we're excited to to roll our sleeves up and get to work to try to help with those uh, efforts to reduce those waste volumes. We also concur. Uh, with uh, Representative Abel and with Mr. Morgan that the return to the state plan and uh, revisiting it and revising it will be very helpful to the state um, to uh, achieve its uh, waste management goals. Um, you know, as, a, as an industry representative, um, you know, we are those companies, the magic workers that uh, uh, Mr. Morgan talked about where we uh, pick up the trash to make it go away. But at the same time, we're also the same people who manage the recyclables uh, we manage the uh, compostables and we um, uh, work to divert material and educate our customers and work with business businesses on source reduction. So these are important goals of uh, modern materials management. We're part of that industry and we're grateful to be here today to testify. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to try to answer. And the, the idea of targeted reductions and returning to the state plan are uh, bellwethers of good uh, solid waste management principles. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, any questions from the committee? Seeing none. Okay, next up, we have Stephen Pogge. Welcome, Stephen. Mr. Pogge, you should be able to unmute yourself. You're still muted, there you go. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Stephen Podge. I'm the Director of Operations for Waste Management's Transfer and Disposal Operations in New Hampshire. Waste management is the leading provider of solid waste and recycling services in North America. In New Hampshire, we operate the Turnkey Recycling and Environmental Enterprise Facility, also known as TREE. We operate four solid waste transfer stations, recycling plant, and approximately 200 waste collection trucks every day. We manage close to 40% of the solid waste and recyclables that are now generated in New Hampshire. We've been operating in the state for nearly 40 years and have a valuable perspective on the realities of managing solid waste and complying with the laws and regulatory requirements in the state. Um, addressing my comments uh, to part two of Senate Bill 146, as it deals with establishing a statewide solid waste disposal uh, reduction goal. First off, I'd like to commend the work that's been done by the legislature the last couple of sessions in the area of solid waste. Uh, these have largely been spearheaded by the Recycling and Solid Waste Management Study Committee, chaired by Representative Ebel that you just heard from, and supported by Senator David Waters. As part of their effort, Waste Management conducted tours of the turnkey facility and our Bill Worker Material Recovery Facility, or MRF. We also discussed some of the challenges impacting the industry as a result of regulations and international policy changes and their effect on the economics of recycling. We support Senate Bill 146 and believe it will help to address some of the challenges presented by the existing law, RSA 149M. The current law has guided the operation of solid waste management facilities since it was enacted 30 years ago. And the new law would provide important updates and clarification on the requirements to both regulators and the regulated community. The proposed legislation specifically targets the types of waste that should be reduced to reach the waste reduction goals for the state. This would avoid confusion in the future and would allow generators in the waste industry to target materials in the waste stream 
specifically municipal solid waste that's not previously been recycled or commercially or industrial uh, institutionally generated waste also that has not gone through the recycle process. The reduction goal excludes waste streams that have already been recycled or material that have no other reasonably viable alternative to landfilling, such as the municipal waste after it's already been recycled and recyclables have been removed, residuals from recycling operations such as MRFs, c and processing operations, scrap metal operations, and waste for which recycling or weight reduction is not practical or is unsafe, such as asbestos, sludges, industrial residuals, impacted soils, such as from petroleum spills. Focusing on diverting waste streams will allow landfill space to be reserved for residual materials and waste that require secure disposal. We believe the bill will clarify longstanding confusion on how best to increase recycling, reduce waste disposal, and avoid confusion in the future. We appreciate the opportunity to provide our comments on this important matter and are willing to address any questions the committee may have. Any questions from the committee? All right, Stephen, I have one. Oh, Senator Waters, go ahead. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to um, express my uh, thanks to um, Steve for all the work that uh, has been done over the last couple of years uh, on this and a uh, good partnership here. And I appreciate your coming in today. Thank you. It's all yours, you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, thank you, Senator Waters. Uh, uh, Stephen, I just, uh, whenever I hear, you know, somebody give an acronym, you know, TREE or MRF, what is MRF? MRF is an acronym for Material Recovery Facility or more readily known as a recycling plant. And TREE? Tree is the turnkey recycling in environmental enterprise facility. It's the operation we have in the Rochester, uh, New Hampshire location. All right. Uh, see, I ran out of questions on my last person, so. <laughs> okay. You get off easy. Thank you very much. I really appreciate your testimony. Thanks. Yes, sir. Okay, next up we have Reagan Bissonette. Good afternoon. Thank you. My name is Reagan Bissonette. I am the executive director of the Northeast Resource Recovery Association, and we worked closely with Senator Waters and Representative Ebel as part of the Recycling and Solid Waste Study Committee. So the Northeast Resource Recovery Association is a recycling nonprofit, and we work with municipalities to help them manage their own recycling programs and reduce their waste. We've been doing that for 40 years, and here in New Hampshire, over 80% of New Hampshire's towns and cities are members of NRRA. We do not take a position on SB 146 because we as a nonprofit don't lobby, but I did want to share some information that might be relevant to the committee as you consider this bill. As others have mentioned, the cost of disposing of solid waste in New Hampshire is among the highest across the entire country. And that is in part because we have the least amount of available space for new or expanded landfills. And we expect that that cost will continue to rise over time. And so what that means is that anything the state can do to help municipalities reduce their solid waste whether it's through increased recycling or composting or just overall waste reduction strategies, that should help municipalities save money and ultimately help save taxpayer money. So reducing waste is a financially valuable uh, move for supporting our municipalities. So one thing that may seem very obvious, but if we're going to have a new state solid waste reduction goal, it's really important for that goal to be measurable by the Department of Environmental Services. And under the current, um, under the current solid waste reduction goal for the state, DES has been unable to meaningfully measure whether we've met that goal in part because uh, of the way that the goal was written. So the benefit of this uh, SB 146 part two is that the goal is written in such a way that it will be much easier for DES to actually measure our progress towards reaching that goal, which is of course very important. I will say that 
you know, ideally it would be great if we would also be able to measure where we're at as a state in terms of what is our current waste that we're generating. So we don't have a recent waste characterization study for New Hampshire that would tell us what types of waste we're generating and how much is being disposed, recycled, or composted. And that could help us further uh, reach our goals by telling us what our baseline is. And then finally, I do echo Mark Morgan's concerns about moving the timeline for the solid waste plan from six years to 10 years. I understand that we certainly have limitations among uh, DES regarding staff time to put into this, but um, I do think it'd be beneficial if we could have even, um, you know, a, a, mid, a midterm report across that 10 years, because a lot can change in 10 years. And certainly by setting these new goals, we hope that a lot will change in 10 years. Thank you. Questions from the committee. I have a looming one, but I'm not sure I want to ask it. So I'll just wait. <laughs> um, thank you very much for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. And the final speaker we have for part two is Mike Nork. Well, Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, my name is Michael Nork for the record, uh, testifying in support of part two uh, for DES. I represent the Solid Waste Management Bureau. Um, I will keep my comments very short because at this point, I think most of what I was gonna say has already been covered by previous testimony. Um, I do wanna just reiterate that this goal is something that would uh, take a current goal, which is slightly confusing and difficult for us to measure and turn it into something that would be easy for us to measure because we would have readily available data. We would have data on what is disposed in New Hampshire and be able to track how that changes over time. Um, the current goal requires us to measure uh, changes in waste generation. Um, and as outlined, I gave uh, some testimony, uh, written testimony to the committee um, that you can look there for further context on why the current goal is a little bit confusing and difficult to track. Um, but again, just want to reiterate that this um, proposed reframing of the goal to a disposal reduction uh, goal would actually make it much easier for us to, to track progress over time. Um, the other thing I just want to clarify is uh, there's been some comments on the 10 year uh, uh, interval for uh, the solid waste management plan, which um, the way the, the, the current statute is structured we have the requirement to issue a biennial report. So every two years we issue a report uh, on tracking progress towards this goal. Um, the solid waste management plan is kind of an overarching uh, you know, framework in terms of how we approach solid waste management in the state, what, what our goals are, you know, what, uh, what our targets might be for um, you know, continuing to uphold the hierarchy of waste management and, and this goal. Um, so I just want to clarify that the, the 10 year, you know, issuing a, a solid waste management plan every 10 years doesn't mean that we can't update it more frequently. Um, and also those biennial reports as Senator Waters had mentioned earlier um, would allow us to check in periodically to see, you know, our circumstances changing, do, do we need to update the goal or do we need to update our solid waste management plan in some significant way? So there are mechanisms to allow us to keep track of these things on an ongoing basis as has been mentioned by folks uh, previous to me, there are definitely uh, resource issues at the, at the Solid Waste Management Bureau. Um, but uh, you know, these, are th these are obviously issues that are priorities for us to continue to work towards and continue to devote effort to. Um, and just to, to close, I, I did want to um, mention, Senator Waters had indicated that the date for the Solid Waste Management Plan in the current language as introduced hasn't changed from the previous bill last year. Um, and it would probably be advisable to extend that by one year to allow us to actually have time to implement, um, you know, actually drafting that plan uh, and releasing it by, uh, I think on page five of the bill, um, it says on line 32, beginning October 1st, 2021. Uh, I would recommend that that be changed to uh, October 1st, 2022. 
And with that, I'll close my uh, remarks, but if you have any questions for me, I'm happy to address. I think Senator Waters, you made that mentioned uh, earlier, didn't you? Uh, yes, and you, you recognize that you're muted. Dave. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And yes, I did. And uh, Mike, um, I don't know if you heard me earlier, but I sense that if we do that, then would I also need to um, change the uh, every other year to the odd year? Or how, how would you want that in terms of reports? I think it would probably, it could stay as is um, because um, okay, it, it'll still give us a year to All right. have All right. some data to report right. in that biennial report. So I think that's fine. I think the, the priority would be just uh, focusing on the, the date of the, uh, the solid waste management plan on line 32. Good, thank you. Thanks. Griffin, do you have that? Yes, I do. Okay, I wasn't looking up. Great, thank you, sir. Uh, Mike, thank you very much for your uh, testimony. Uh, are there any other t questions? Seeing none. Okay, so we're gonna move on to part three of the bill. So if anyone's interested in testifying, if you could please raise your hand. If you're calling in by phone, if you could press star nine. So Senator Favard, if you're okay, we're gonna go ahead and start with Omar Terry. Yes, welcome Omar. Good afternoon, Chairman, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Excellent. Well, good afternoon, Chairman, members of the committee. My name is Omar Terry with the American Chemistry Council, um, specifically the Plastic Food Service Packaging Group. Um, I'm calling to specifically talk about um, uh, the part three, the Plastics Advisory Council. Um, we did receive some of Senator Waters' amendments prior to this committee hearing today. And um, if those amendments are accepted by the um, by the committee, we are supportive of the amendments to uh, to sunset having a plastic advisory council and having the Department of um, Environmental um, Services review some of the research technology implications over this. Um, but we do want to ensure that as um, if DES is going to be putting out a report that um, they look at having uh, toxicologists and ecological experts and exposure experts as part of the review of uh, these uh, of these impacts, especially around human health and environmental impacts, uh, primarily because those are the types of specialists that would be able to really be able to inform inform the department and thus the legislature on health and human. Um, environmental impacts around, you know, wildlife and, and human beings. Um, also, uh, there is a specialty around microplastics that is starting to form. So considering that there are microplastics is a centerpiece of this, we really want to make sure that the department has the best data to be um, informed with, the, you know, to inform all of the members, obviously. Um, that's obviously already a specialty. We would also ask uh, that there be no further plastic bills introduced uh, during this time period until after uh, the department has been able to uh, submit a report to the legislature, as well as um, the legislature's had an opportunity to review that. Um, and then finally, uh, we encourage that advanced recycling technologies be considered um, by the department um, when it comes to the ways to reduce plastic waste in the environment um, and single-use plastics as those types of technologies are instrumental in reaching uh, sustainability goals. Um, should the legislature, excuse me, should the committee not um, move forward with the amendment to incorporate the Department of Environmental Services and sunset the Advisory Council, we would suggest these same uh, suggestions and technical comments for the Plastic Advisory Council, uh, but even more so, it would be necessary to have a toxicologist, ecological experts, and exposure experts, because frankly, uh, the makeup of the current Plastic Advisory Council um, doesn't have the expertise to really look into human health and environmental health aspects, as the Plastic Advisory Council, as it's currently written, would be a better body to look at uh, recycling, circularity goals, and sustainability. Um, and with that, I will close and answer any questions. I'm trying to respect the three minute mark. Well said, uh, thank you. And Senator Waters. 
Yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, Mr. Terry, I, I don't have a question so much as to say that I, I assure you that each point you're making is one that I agree with. And um, it's one of the reasons we went to the change to the department so they could take available of the take advantage of the available science and uh, toxicology. We gotta we gotta have the facts here, right? Um, yes, sir. Just because something is PFAS doesn't mean it's necessarily poisonous. It's, you know, there there are stable compounds, there are uses, there are ones that can be, you know. So I, I think it's important that we have the department do its job and get the um, research there. Also, let me tell you, I mean, microplastics, I'm extremely concerned about because of my interest in fisheries. And I know a lot of work is going in there too. And and there as well, I, I think it's important that we, we follow the science. And um, on further bills too, I mean, we can't control what people introduce, but I think you're right essentially that, and that's the reason I put this bill together. We got to know what we're facing. We've got to plan carefully. A lot of my colleagues around the states are looking toward extended producer responsibility. I have drafted bills on that. I've looked at it carefully. And, um, you know, I just think that we have to really know what what we can do, where we're going and why we're doing it before we um, jump as a state into some of, some of these things too. So th thanks again, not really a question here, but I appreciate your testimony. Oh, well, thank you, Senator Waters. Um, just for your edification, as well as the committee, um, the American Chemistry Council has stood up a microplastics research group um, that is uh, being heavily funded by our members to do research um, throughout not only the United States, but on a global scale to really figure out um, if there are any health impacts to, um, you know, both human health as well as animals and the environment. Um, so that is something that we are very heavily interested in. We don't want our products to be misused. Um, and then also we would be very happy to be um, engaging with DES as they look into some of these, uh, you know, some of these issues. Um, so please definitely reach out to us, but we will be on the lookout for any, um, you know, public comment periods or uh, any outreach that the Department of Environmental Services does. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Um, Senator uh, Goddard, could you take over just for a few minutes? Okay, Senator Goddard, if there's no other Could questions. I unmute here? Yes, I'm having mute problems. Certainly, thank you. <clears throat> All right. Okay, so up next we have Sean Swearingen. Mr. Swearingen, go ahead, please. You can you hear me all right? Yes. Perfect, thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, the committee's time to be here and I'll try and keep my comments brief within the three minute window. My name is Sean Swearingen, I'm a director at the American Chemistry Council and speaking on behalf of the Alliance for Telomer Chemistry Stewardship. ATCS is a global organization that advocates on behalf of C6 telomer based products. While we agree with some of the principles included in the omnibus bill, I understand that there have been some amendments. The members of ATCS respectfully request that uh, we add a couple of more amendments to this part three of the omnibus bill, uh, striking additional food packaging language that is presently covered by the FDA, allow for continued sale, distribution, and use of effective products that are already in commerce in New Hampshire as of the effective date of the act, Date definitions of PFAS, food packaging, and firefighting foam, and finally allow incineration to remain as a disposal method of AFFF. Uh, the chemical industry supports a comprehensive approach to managing per and poly, polyflora alcohol uh, substances that helps to ensure protection of human health and the environment. This includes appropriate science-based policies and regulations. And uh, feel free to refer to my written testimony for any um, scientific studies referenced. Um, as underlined in the omnibus bill, food packaging is strictly regulated by the FDA. Substances used in food packaging must complete a rigorous review process before they are sold or distributed in the U.S. Um, let's see here. In connection with this reassessment by the FDA, manufacturers of the majority of the PFAS products used in fiber-based food packaging agreed to a voluntary phase-out leading to the discontinuation of sales of these products for use in food packaging as of January 1st, 2024. As reflected in its announcement of this agreement, FDA concluded that this phase out period is needed to avoid unnecessary food supply chain and market disruptions. And we ask that it be included in this bill. Provision banning incineration is at best unnecessary and unfortunately at worst would severely hamper ongoing cleanup. Um, and this is incineration as it refers to AFFF. 
This language would prevent utilizing the best available technology to manage and remediate priority PFAS substances, essentially undermining all existing cleanup efforts. The fiscal year 2020 National Defense Authorization Act required the Department of Defense to develop regulations and the EPA to develop guidance for the management and disposal of PFAS. EPA is presently in the comment period for finalizing that guidance. This will complete, be completed by the new Biden administration. Uh, for these reasons, respectfully, we, we respectfully request that you strike the additional food packaging language, uh, allow for the window after the effective date, uh, update the definitions of PFAS and food packaging, and allow incineration to remain as a disposal method for AFFF. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Are there any uh, further questions from the committee? I would, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Please. Yeah, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thanks for coming in, um, Sean. And um, uh, you're, I haven't seen your uh, written testimony yet, um, but you, you say you have some specifics there as to what you're, re you're suggesting in terms of language. Correct, and, yes, and, and happy to discuss those with your office uh, after you have time to review them. Yeah, thank you. Um, and um, just a couple of things. I mean, I, I'm, I really apologize for the amendment process in that they, the amendments were produced like late Friday afternoon for this one. And it's just, it's just the way things are right now. Um, so I'm you know, sorry that people didn't get to see those. And I think what's unfortunate in the, in the process of writing the bill is that there never was a ban on incineration. Um, it got somehow stuck in the title there, but it, it never was. Um, so, uh, you know, when, if you can take, if you, you know, it basically what it says, because you haven't seen the amendment, it says that, that incineration can continue, but DES has to certify that it's safe. Um, so that's what those are at. On the food packaging, I did have a, a couple of questions there. You know, I'm, I'm fully aware of the EPA and its process and, you know, how, you know, they set some standards a while back and then things kind of slowed down a whole lot over the last four years. And I know that they're moving forward. And as I mentioned, A-hole Day Hayes has decided to eliminate these camels from food packaging and so on. So um, I guess what you're saying is that if, as you believe, the FDA is going to have a phase out deadline of January 1st, 2024, that you would like us to target that as the date here? Correct. Uh, thank you, Senator. And I believe that is the date that is in, in the omnibus bill. Uh, what we'd like to seek is an additional line allowing for that, that window to carry forward uh, for items that may already be in commerce at that time. Gotcha. So yeah, any restaurants or retailers that still have that in yeah. stock. Yeah. That yeah, of course. They can get rid of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, I had a similar provision in my um, my uh, furniture uh, bill a couple of years ago, and it's just what we should do. Um, now, the, the other question for you on this though is, and I, and I think that makes sense and I'll, I'll see what we can do about that. The other question I'd have on it though, is that, um, you know, oftentimes we find, you know, the feds don't come here and enforce stuff, right? Um, and so that lots of times we will have state statute that may reference the federal statute, but give us some enforcement authority. Certainly. Um, not that I expect it to be the bad, bad actors, but you know, we're trying to protect the public health of our consumers. So if we have something like that, is, is, that's not the problem. No, not at all. Um, I, I think the FDA even stated in, in their announcement uh, an 18 month window and then some, uh, main, or excuse me, some retailers such as McDonald's yeah. come out with their own timelines of 2025. Yeah. To be even even later. Yeah. All right. That's very helpful. And I, I think maybe we need to uh, be able to virtually sit down and go over this so I understand just um, the advice you're offering. But thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, committee. Further questions or comments from the committee? Senator Avard, I see you have returned. I had. We had a, dark, uh, a barking dog. <laughs> And I wasn't a squirrel. So thank you very much, Senator. Um, uh, Jen? We're gonna move on to David Creer. Hi, uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I have a lot to say, so I'll try and do this quickly as I can. 
Uh, my name is David Creer. I'm Director of Public Policy at the Business and Industry Association of New Hampshire. Uh, I want to speak to part three, and to be clear, we're opposing only part three and uh, part eight, which we'll talk to later. Um, <clears throat> and the issues with part three, uh, the biggest issue, I think, is that the definition of PFAS uh, is any fluorinated or any uh, compound with at least one fluorinated carbon atom. Uh, the issue is this takes into account all of every single of the uh, PFAS chemicals. So that's nearly 5,000 of them, including the ones that I think have already been referenced uh, that have been shown to be safe and, and completely fine. Um, so the problem is once you start with that definition, uh, then it's banning or the, the laws will apply to uh, all of uh, PFAS and not just the four that are currently regulated uh, by state law. And I understand there's an amendment, apologies. Um, I wasn't able to review it earlier, uh, but I'll be sure to do so and, and let you know if anything changes uh, in my testimony. Um, and then also in, in terms of the part of the uh, bill which uh, talks about incineration of PFAS, um, even though it's not an outright ban on incineration of PFAS chemicals, uh, it does have, I believe, an unfortunate effect of requiring uh, more regulation on incineration of PFAS so that uh, the, the language is a little bit vague. So it's unknown if uh, stack testing would be required, how much stack testing would be required uh, when incineration, um, you know, some facilities might incinerate PFAS every day as part of their processes. Uh, again, this is, you know, um, other PFAS chemicals other than the four regulated ones at times. Um, and stack testing is quite expensive. It could be hundreds of thousands of dollars. So this is quite a significant burden depending on how the statute is, uh, would be interpreted. Uh, this seems to discourage incineration of PFAS and there's other language in the original bill. Again, I'm talking about the original bill. Uh, there's additional language that seems to imply that we would rather ship PFAS out of state than incinerate it. And the way, you know, I've been told about this is that incineration is actually one of the most effective ways to actually destroy the compound and um, eliminate it from the system rather than gather it up to go somewhere else to, you know, potentially cause a problem down the road. So I'm not sure why we would uh, encourage the gathering up and shipping it out of state rather than incinerating it and dealing with the problem, uh, the issue ourselves. Uh, as for the packaging issue, uh, it, it substantially has the same um, definition as I previously talked about. Again, that's too broad. Uh, so it would create overly burdensome regulation to eliminate all of these PFAS chemicals where many of those uh, chemicals have been inert and have been shown to have no adverse health health or environmental effects. Uh, and it just seems um, like it would be overly burdensome mm -hmm. for our businesses. And the final point, I'll quickly, sorry, I, I knew I was getting close. Um, the final point I'll make is on the Plastics Advisory Council. Uh, we just noticed that um, it seems to be underrepresenting businesses that would be impacted by the work of that uh, advisory council. Uh, so we'd like to see more uh, business representation from people who use uh, these plastics, um, as well as manufacturers of the plastics and, and manufacturers that need to use that plastic. And so thank you for allowing me a little bit extra time. I appreciate it. Senator Waters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, th thanks, David. And I, I think if you may have heard in the previous testimony, um, some agreement with some of the issues that you're, you're raising. Um, and so um, let me just get to the point on the, um, the well, for, for one thing, the Plastics Advisory Council is out, so you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> <Cool>. <laughs> right? yeah. And then on the packaging issue, I don't know if you heard my opening testimony or if you're aware of the BPI, the, the Biogradable um, Institute. And the, that, that's really why that's there, that for all those you know, inert ones and stable ones and so on that if they just take, and this is just, we're just talking about food packaging, right? You get that, just food packaging. 
-hmm. that if they take that packaging, which we hear is going to be outlawed anyways by January 1st, 2024 at the federal level, um, that if they get um, it included on that list, they're good to go. And I mean, I think that's important for industry to know that this is not, you know, trying to target those things that don't need to be targeted. So I just didn't know if you were you aware of that. So I, I, I guess let me ask, I'm not overly familiar with the, the BPI list, um, but I think the issue is as the bill is written, uh, step one is PFAS is all of these chemicals that contain one fluorinated carbon. And then step two is that the law states that they <laughs> shall not be used. So it's, it's I yeah. guess, confusing at best, um, whether or not all of them would be banned. I mean, I think if the definition was limited to just those that are otherwise regulated by uh, statute, it would kind of alleviate the concern yeah. Uh, yeah. that we were raising. Yeah, it's it's tricky. As I'll just say is that um, you know, I that def, there are two or three definitions out there that the feds use and other folks use, and so I was just trying to you know, it's just <laughs> what language you're going to have, and then sometimes it's not not doesn't work exactly the way you want it to. So um, under advisement. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions from the committee? I do have one question with regards to uh, incinerating versus shipping it out. Uh, maybe this goes to you, Senator Waters, I'm not sure, but uh, why, you know, would it be more beneficial to, to be able to incinerate it with, with the certain type of filters or something? Well, th thanks, Mr. Chairman. And um, we can talk about this, you know, in exec or, or otherwise, but, I mentioned, I put that in there because there was a specialized facility in Copake, New York, which was set up to take to take this firefighting foam and, and incinerate. And um, so it seemed to make sense. And then you know, there's some issues raised about that one. I know that there's been a lot of work done to put scrubbers on and to, you know, to deal with the, the, the stacks and, and so on here. And I, and I, I appreciate that. Um, but, you know, I mean, St. Cole and Bain's back in the news, right, about being sued again for not fulfilling the requirements that were put on its stack, right? Um, and, you know, these, these are big suits, and, you know, we've all been going through this. So the bill was just meant to, to give the DES the opportunity to say, we've done, we've done what we've done here to do. So, um, that's that's really what the bill is trying to say. We, let's just make sure we've we've had the appropriate look at this stuff. Um, I hear what Creer is saying about overregulation, and I've heard that from DES too in terms of what are we really expecting here. And I, I that's something that needs to be thought about. Right. Uh, any other questions from the committee? All right. Thank you, David. I really appreciate your input. Great. Thank you. Okay, next up we have Mike Fitzgerald. And Mike, if I'm not mistaken, um, Kathy Bean is also going to be testifying with you. So we'll bring her in as well. That's correct. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. And also uh, possibly Mike Wimsett may need to weigh in if there are questions relative to the um, definitions of, of PFAS containing waste. So if you could elevate him as well. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I'm Mike Fitzgerald, and the Assistant Director of the Air Division. I'm joined by Catherine Beam, who's uh, uh, in charge of our planning and uh, our response to uh, PFAS air emissions issues here in the state. And I um, appreciate the opportunity to testify. We do oppose this bill. We do understand, uh, we, and I'm specifically addressing um, page five lines uh, uh, Five through 24, the PFAS incineration, uh, uh, first section of part three. Um, other staff from DES, Mike Wimsett and Mike Nork will address the uh, remainder of the uh, of part three. But um, our concerns uh, sort of echo what uh, was raised by Mr. Creer. We, uh, we do understand that um, this is an area of intense scientific uh, emerging science and study on a national basis, uh, air emissions of PFAS, um, uh, as was alluded to by Senator Waters, um, the, we do have 
uh, statute RSA 125C10E that was passed a couple of years ago, passed into law a couple of years ago to address the emissions issues in Southern New Hampshire from industrial facilities there and the, uh, uh, the, the appeals of the permit and lawsuit um, uh, surrounding that are ongoing. This bill could inject some uncertainty into um, uh, our, our application of that permit. Um, this is uh, somewhat analogous to uh, asking me to um, prove to you that I'm not a bank robber, which I assure you I'm not. Um, that uh, you know, before we incinerate, as was mentioned, there are over 5,000 chemicals um, in the definition here, thousands of, thousands of chemicals for which there is not a strong understanding of their impact um, scientifically and um, their impact on public health and the environment. So um, those requirements, while we understand the concerns, um, they're, they're rather vague and um, uh, target a, an extremely wide class of compounds that, um, uh, that we would need to make determinations on. I would also state that um, at this point in time, we're unaware of any um, plans to uh, incinerate uh, and, and any facility that did want to incinerate any um, uh, PFAS containing materials here in New Hampshire would need to abide by our already existing statutes in RSA 125C10E, which requires best available control technology. Um, and that was adopted in response to the issues that occurred down in Southern New Hampshire um, back in 2016. And uh, also in, they would have to respond to all the requirements under 125 and under um, the Air, uh, Air Toxics Control Act. Um, which is a, uh, another, another statute that might reg, uh, regulate some of these compounds. So um, uh, we, our, our testimony letter highlighted our, our primary concerns. We do feel there may also be some um, issues with the uh, Commerce Clause that seems to have gotten some uh, discussion today. There are uh, potential issues with requiring us to determine that um, no one out of state can accept it uh, prior to um, us allowing for incineration here. And um, uh, in summary, this might be uh, somewhat premature, uh, um, duplicative and regulatory nature um, and impose some regulatory uncertainties. And uh, we'd be happy to address any questions um, as, as uh, um, time would allow. Uh, Michael, thank you for that. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and just uh, for a little more clarification. You said something to the effect, uh, no one from out of state can accept it if we provide for incineration. Is that what, did I hear you correctly? Uh, I believe the statute. I don't have it right right specifically in front of me, but I believe the statute requires DES to determine that there's no out of state okay. facilities that can can accept this. Um, uh, again, we would just urge that the committee get some input from uh, from counsel or the attorney general's office. That that does pose um, constitutional commerce clause uh, potential commerce clause issues, um, as similar to what Mr. Morgan was mentioning with regards to interstate waste. Um, you know that that uh, that could potentially uh, interfere with the uh, uh, the ability of of there to be an interstate commerce. Um, uh, re with regards to incineration of this waste. So um, that's, that's, a, that's a minor concern. We just thought we ought to highlight it and, and uh, at least, at least al allow the committee to have some discussion on it. Uh, just going to backtrack before I take any more questions from the committee. So you're okay with section two? Section two, no DES. Uh, uh, well, I'm, 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 I don't know. Section two DES supplied a separate testimony letter on. And uh, when we're finished here with uh, section one, um, Michael Nork and, and Mike Wimsett uh, of DS are prepared to address that as well. I, I don't know the, the position, their position on that. Okay, I just wanna make sure we're not crossing, we're bleeding in. Well, I, I, at, this, at this moment, I'm just addressing section one. Okay, all right, section one. Part three, section one, so. No, I see, I see, okay, thank you. The, 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 lines four through 25 that address um, incineration of, of uh, class B firefighting foam and PFAS containing wastes. Thank you. Senator Waters, did you have your hand up? Oh, you didn't? Oh, wow. All right. 
Uh, seeing none, uh, no further questions from the committee. You folks did really well. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Right. Chairman. We appreciate the opportunity. So, so Mr. Fistral, so sorry, are any of the other individuals testifying regarding part three, but different sections? Uh, yes, I believe Mike Wimsett and Mike North plan to testify okay. about part three, section two. Okay. So Mr. Wimsett and Mr. Nork, if one of you would like to take the lead on that. Certainly, uh, thank you. Uh, for the record, this, my name is Mike Wimsett. I serve as director of the Waste Management Division and I'm uh, happy to uh, provide testimony on Senate Bill 146 today with respect to part three and the, 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 sec the sections that follow the prohibition. I'm not gonna, my testimony will not be addressing the prohibition on incineration, which uh, Mike Fitzgerald just addressed. And Mr. Chairman, uh, relative to your question about, <laughs> make sure we use the right terminology for part two of the bill. Yes, we already, as you know, heard testimony on that. And Mike Nork's testimony is that just to be clear for the record that DES is in support of part two of the bill. Okay, good. <laughs> and I will preface my remarks by saying that overall, the department uh, is very supportive of Senate Bill 146. Uh, as you've heard some testimony already and you'll hear it in, on future parts. Um, but my testimony here is gonna be limited to just the remainder of, of section three here, which, uh, which uh, relates to uh, the issues of the Plastics Advisory Council and the, original bill and, uh, the prohibition and packaging. Um, so I don't want to <coughs> Sorry, I do have a letter. Senator Guy, you're in charge real quick. I do want to mention that um, with respect to uh, our letter of testimony, that was drafted with respect to the original bill as originally drafted. But I will, my testimony today, I'll try to focus more specifically on the proposed amendment that Senator Waters has described. And uh, essentially, um, we're not taking a position on these portions of the bill, um, but we have identified a couple of potential issues of concern that, that I wanted to highlight for the committee today. Um, and essentially they break down into two things, uh, possible some unattended consequences or issue with the, with the language. And then the second part is that it, these provisions do require some additional resources expended by the department and, and, and the bill doesn't provide for those resources and we don't really have those resources. So I wanna talk just a little bit about that and I'll, I'll try to keep my remarks very brief. So the first issue, the uh, structural potential structural issue we identified is that it appears as though um, the bill intends to uh, amend New Hampshire's existing, existing toxics packaging law um, that starts at uh, RSA 149M32, um, but the amendments are incomplete. So it inserts the definition of PFAS and inserts PFAS into certain sections of that law but it doesn't explicitly prohibit the use of PFAS and packaging there. Instead, it creates a separate chapter, one R say 149M, uh, excuse me, 149R uh, with that prohibition. And we just feel that sort of structurally that may create some confusion and possibly a disconnect uh, that may have, you know, so such that it might not have the desired effect of the legislation and may make it more difficult to administer. Um, more importantly, I want to talk just a moment about the second issue, and that is that there are new and expanded responsibilities here uh, with no specific resources provided for that in the bill. And for example, the newly created RSA 149R that I just spoke about would impose this prohibition on the inclusion of PFAS and packaging and would require manufacturers to report to DES. As such, DES is directed to make rules relative to forms and reporting and the overall administration of the prohibition or reporting requirement. And along with that comes a responsibility to enforce the provisions of the rules and the statute. And the bill doesn't provide any resource to that. So it's difficult for us to come out sort of full-throated support because we feel that we don't have the resources for this new, new program. And I think what I would further say on that is that New Hampshire is part of, DES is part of a uh, regional consortium called the Toxics Packaging Clearinghouse. And we've worked with them over time to implement the existing toxic packaging legislation in New Hampshire. Um, and they have been working for some time on model legislation that would do what I think this bill is trying to do here with respect to PFAS and packaging. 
And uh, we haven't, it's just come out and we haven't really had a chance to wrap our heads around it. But the, the benefit of that is that it represents collaboration between states, industry stakeholders and others uh, to try to establish a consistent national framework. And our view on this is that, um, you know, that might be something worth considering in the future for legislation, because that would, one of the things I know that industry does not like, sympathetic to that, is when you have states implementing a mosaic of different requirements. If you're a national corporation doing national manufacturing, it becomes very difficult to, to, to basically, um, you know, comp comply with those various requirements in each state. So Director Wimsat. If it's possible to, uh, uh, look to this in a broader federal context, um, a re at least regional context, that it's more efficient use of our limited resources. And I'll, I'll leave it at that and be happy to entertain any questions. Any questions from the committee? Yeah, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I may. Senator Waters. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mike, I just want to thank you once again for all your hard work on, on this and on everything else. Um, and, uh, you know, it may be, if it's all right with you, I guess make it a question is, okay, if um, perhaps you and I work with a drafting attorney in terms of the, um, whether this creates a new section or not. I, I went all around on that and maybe um, we need to sit down together. So does that make sense to you? Certainly be happy to work on that with you. All right. Um, and then uh, on the cartons and packaging, I mean, you know, I don't know if you heard my introduction, you know, A-Hole De Del Hayes is going to eliminate all PFAS in their food packaging and they handle most of the brands for stores in New Hampshire. And uh, we heard that the FDA, uh, and I hadn't heard this, but the, apparently in the omnibus bill, there is a, a ban on this starting January 1st, 2024, on food packaging with PFAS. So, um, you know, the, there's a lot up in the air. And then also you referenced the cartons and packaging uh, regional councils. So um, my question would be, you know, hearing this, uh, and basically with the goal here, as you, as you well know, just to make sure that New Hampshire consumers have the protections they need that are are reasonable. Do you think it'd be possible, you know, to craft something that it, it recognizes what's coming from the feds? I mean, I guess that bill is going to pass middle of the next week or not much later. And then, um, you know, if you have something from the cartons and packaging council um, that we might be able to find a way that greatly simplifies this, but just says that we have some authority in the state um in these areas thank you senator I, I think des definitely would you know conceptually support that approach absolutely i my sense is that there's so much in play here right now and there, it seems like there's a lot of moving parts around this and i, I want to just in the aggregate and, you know looking at from the fifty thousand foot view des has been saying for several years now as we've been dealing with this pfas problem that we believe the only way to really solve the problem over the long term is to get to the extent feasible to get PFAS out of commerce in places where it doesn't really need to be. Obviously there are uses in medical applications and safety applications that should continue, but you know, it goes to the issue of, you know, does a hamburger wrapper have to have Teflon, in it, that sort of thing. And uh, we, we, we believe that that's been our, our message to EPA for a number of years now that getting it out of commerce is very important. My concern is from the standpoint, we, we are working day and night every day for the last five years to address the PFAS problem. And my only concern is, is that if there are things that are moving forward and making progress um, nationally that are going to help address this commerce issue, we're not, as a department, we're not sure that it's a great use of our limited resources to be focusing on that just for New Hampshire. Realistically, these things have to happen on a regional and national basis to have a meaningful effect. Well, th thanks for that. And of course, that's that's right in a, in a certain way. But I mean, my goodness, our experience with PFAS over the last decade, um, while the rest of the country may be trying to catch up, we get a lot of a lot of people getting sick here and a lot of anxiety about it. But um, you know, on the resource source issue, because it's come up in many different regards. I mean, I get it. 
Um, you know, I had a bill in last time in the solid waste that was going to give us a tipping fee from out of staters to get you some personnel there. And, you know, we're, we're not the finance committee. Um, uh, and I, I, I mean, I, as a question, I mean, I think you can understand, can't you, that we're torn between understanding your staffing issues and we're responsible for them in a lot of ways in the legislature. But, you know, aren't we also you know, as policy committees supposed to try to keep the people of the state safe. And, um, you know, do you understand that's the way I see it? We argue against that. <laughs> okay. Um, any further questions? Any further statements? Mr. Chairman, for, uh, Mike Fitzgerald for the ESG. And I just want to be clear that um, our, our opposition to this was limited to the sections that I testified on, just the uh, just the first section. Um, so totally noted. stated yep. in our letter. Thank you. Any, uh, Kathy, are you still there? Yes. Uh, any comments? No. You did a great job. <laughs> <laughs> She's our star performer. She's star performer. <laughs> We appreciate it. Okay, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I guess we'll move on to the next uh, testifier or test. So that looks like everybody for part three, Senator. So we're gonna move on to part four. So if there's anyone that would like to speak on part four, if you could please raise your hand or if you're calling in by phone, press star nine. All right, looks like we only have one person and it's Mike Fitzgerald. Mike? Oh, his hand, his hand went back down. I'm not sure where he went. And he no longer appears to be in the meeting. I did, um, if I might, I just wanted to note before we move on from part four that Paul Sanderson from New Hampshire Fishing Game is available to take any questions from the committee um, on part four if you have any questions. That could have been structured better. <laughs> Is he in favor? Um, uh, looking at his written testimony, it looks like he signed in support of sections, uh, I'm sorry, I should say part four and part six of the bill. But if there are any questions relevant to part four, he is available. Questions from the committee? Seeing none, uh, okay. so we'll move on to the next part. Part five. So if anybody would like to speak regarding part five, if you could please raise your hand or if you're calling in, press star nine. All right, we've got a Michael Carley. Mr. Carley, you should be able to unmute yourself. Oh, thank you. Um, I'll keep my comments brief. Uh, um, first, I'd like to thank the um, chair and the rest of the committee for allowing me the opportunity to speak in favor of Senate Bill 146 Part 5. Um, I'm representing both the, I have two hats on today, I'm representing both the Nash New Hampshire Water Pollution Control Association and it's 300 members covering the wastewater operators across the state and specifically I uh, also work for the town of Hampton, and we are the first affected by, first treatment plant affected by um, the EPA's decisions on um, the way they interpret the existing RSA. Um, in their interpretations, they're requiring um, treatment plants and facilities that discharge on the seacoast to um, follow both the National Shellfish Sanitation Protocol and um, CFR 136, which already governs um, wastewater discharges into the, um, into, um, the coastal regions. Um, by changing the wording uh, that has been worked out by um, the Watershed Management Bureau Administrator Ted Deers and EPA, they both agree on this wording as in the amendment. And um, 
changing the wording. I mean, the important thing is the changing of the wording does not change the intent of the RSA or the overall goal that all surface waters attain and maintain standards of water quality. Um, so um, putting on my chief operator hat, uh, not passing the bill will require us to um, do additional sampling, redundant sampling uh, for fecal coliform, um, which is going to be both costly and time consuming. Um, um, finally, I just want to mention, um, I think Tom Donovan and the um, rest of the staff at the um, water division uh, who has worked um, closely with the EPA to either to, um, to resolve this issue. Um, thank you. Questions from the committee? Uh, seeing none, I have a question, Michael. Um, sure. So not passing this bill would require a redundant or uh, costly sampling again, or uh, did I hear you correctly? Sure. Um, so in existing permits, and this goes for the, um, the 13 other facilities that will be affected by this as their permits are renewed, um, we are all required to test for fecal coliform bacteria. Uh, the main goal is to make sure that the shellfish um, industry is protected um, and they have fair warning. Um, the EPA has, in their interpretation, they are requiring us to uh, test for fecal coliform in a, in a different method that um, they had from what they've already been allowing. So um, for, for us, that means um, we, can, we have a test method that we can do in-house and produce uh, results that are um, timely for the shellfish division. Um, we are also, we are now required, the test that they're requiring us to do now, we have to send somebody up to Concord three days a week uh, because the Concord lab is the only one um, in close proximity that can run the test. So uh, um, just to clarify, how does that help you then? Uh, how, how is this helping you? So if it is not passed, what will happen is we'll have to, I mean, the Concord lab is only doing this on a temporary basis because they're not, um, they're not geared up to do this on a full-time basis. Um, so we would have to bring this in-house um, as would all the other facilities. And it's a, a costly um, test to run. Okay, but if we don't run the test, then are we still maintaining uh, good quality uh, uh, testing? Yes, we will, be, we will continue to use testing methods that have already been approved by the EPA. I so, really appreciate you helping walking me through this. Yeah. yeah, no, no. So that's that's why I say it's kind of a re, the 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 new requirement for the discharge permits um, is um, is um, kind of redundant to what we already do. Okay. Well, perfect. Thank you very much. Any uh, questions from the committee? Uh, Senator Guida, it looks like you're talking. Senator Guida? Yeah, you want to call me back? Yes. Or something? Oh, I, I apologize. I thought you were talking. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. I thought you were talking to us. I, I saw you nope. and I'm thinking, and I apologize.
All right, great. So uh, no more further questions. Oh, so we're gonna move on to Mr. Ted Deers then, Senator, if it's okay Thank with you. you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. So I um, thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Ted Deers. I'm the administrator of the Watershed Management Bureau at the Department of Environmental Services. Um, you have entered the arcane world of where the Clean Water Act meets the National Shellfish Sanitation Program, and it is frankly baffling. Um, so if you're feeling a little baffled, it's well-deserved because this is a very uh, it's complicated <laughs> issue. But I think as, as Mr. Carl noted, the whole idea here is for us to come up with the most simple method that is the cheapest for the wastewater treatment plants to perform that provides the best protection for humans who may like to eat shellfish, myself included in that group. So um, the issue here is really one about interpretations of how our law intersects with the Clean Water Act and with the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. The language that you see that Senator Waters placed on the uh, amendment, that amendment language, is very much based on what other states with the same issue have come up uh, against and have come up, and, and that language works. Uh, we've run this through EPA, through their council, and it appears that this is going to do the trick. So I wanted to just, um, first of all, just sort of, uh, again, thank Senator Waters for dealing with this issue. It's been a really, it's been a, a stickler. And, um, and also to just, if you have any other questions that I can help to unravel this a little bit more in, in your minds, please let me know um, either now or, or at any time during your deliberations, because it, it is a, a weird issue. So my shorthand really uh, is, is, is poor. How our laws interact with what? The Clean Water Act and the National Shellfish Sanitation Program. Any questions from the committee? Ted, I really appreciate your, your, your testimony. Thank you. Absolutely, thank you. Hi, looks like that is everyone for that section. So we're gonna move on to the next part of the bill, which I believe, and now I can't remember if we're on part six, five or six now, I believe we're on six now. Yes. Six. So if anyone who's looking to speak on part six of the bill could please raise their hand. And I'm not seeing anyone. So Senator Vard, if it's okay with you, we'll move on to part seven. Yes. So anyone looking to speak on part seven of Senate Bill 146? Okay. We're gonna start with Digit Taylor. Thank you very much. Um, you guys are doing magnificently in uh, working through this long and complicated bill. And I do have a few prepared comments about the bill. Um, I am Digit Taylor. I've had the honor of being the executive director of the Land and Community Heritage Investment Program since 2010. And I have sent you a handout that shows that food is being produced on properties protected by LCHIP in almost all of your districts. <clears throat> the proposal in front of you is to add words to LCHIP's enabling legislation to make the acquisition and preservation of agricultural land for food production a priority of the program. We can all appreciate the importance of local food. I've been telling people for 20 plus years that when airlines get too expensive, we're going to want local apples because it's going to be too hard to get them here from New Zealand. But I believe that the change that is proposed is simply not needed to LCHIP's enabling legislation. Our rules and our law already prioritize agricultural land protection, um, which interestingly was called farmland 20 years ago when LCHIP was created. Nowadays, we're more likely to call it um, agriculture, agricultural land. I see you smiling, Senator Perkins Cuoco. How old were you <laughs> 20 years ago when it was created? Younger, right? Um, so there are in, in the handout that I provided for you, there are um, a number of, um, I'm showing you the number of places in the LCHIP law and in LCHIP's rules that farmland is listed. In the vision statement that the board of directors crafted, um, it says that farmland will be, um, will be a priority and that farmland for food is important to the state. 
Um, the, but the main reason um, LCHIP makes farmland a priority is that it is listed as one of the resources that are eligible to apply for LCHIP funding in the definitions section of LCHIP's RSA. And um, there are 14 of these eligible kinds of resources. So the board of directors already has plenty of priorities to set, select from. And I'm not sure that any of us, much as local food is important, I'm not sure that we want to say that that's more important than having trees or having air to breathe or clean water. So um, another reason that um, I think we don't need to change the, the RSA is that the commissioner of the Department of Agriculture's Markets and Foods serves on the LCHIP board of directors and has stated that he does not think this proposed change is needed. Um, furthermore, the LCHIP board can include the existing priorities of the state in their decision-making. So anytime the state wants to define agriculture as priority or the board believes that the state is behaving in that way, they can already include it. And um, agricultural land also gets special treatment in LCHIP because it's one of only two commercial activities that are normally allowed on land protected with LCHIP. Um, the changes, I believe, are not needed because in addition to the law already setting agriculture as a priority, LCHIP is doing a very good job protecting agricultural land. We've given out, given out more than 200 grants for land conservation since the creation of the program. A third of that land conserves farmland, agricultural land, even though farmland is only one of 10 natural resource categories eligible for LCHIP funding. LCHIP has helped to protect farmland in 60 of New Hampshire's towns and cities, which is about a quarter of them all. And during the five most recent grant rounds, 2016 to 2020, 86% of natural resource projects. Am I out of time? These came, which is good. I'm sorry, I'm not hearing. Uh, so sorry, Digit, there was a little bit of overlap. Um, you have about 10 seconds left. So if you wouldn't mind okay. um, wrapping I, I, it up. I really don't think we need, you need to make this change. And as Senator Bradley said, um, there is an expectation of $250,000 for agricultural protection. If you do feel you need to make a change, I, I will propose a place in the RSA where it'd be less disruptive to add this language. And I can work with Senator Bradley on that if, if that's the direction the committee prefers to go. Thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions. That was just fine. Uh, any questions from the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to our next speaker or... Jen, you are muted. It was my turn to do it, Senator. <laughs> um, it doesn't appear that there is anybody else looking to speak on this part. So if it's all right with you, we're gonna move on to part eight. So if anyone who would like to speak on part eight would raise their hand. And we're going to start with Bruce Burke. Um, so Mr. Burke, you are using an older version of Zoom. So we're going to promote you. But unfortunately, we're going to have to I, kick you out after um, you complete your testimony. That's fine. Bruce. That's fine. So uh, first, good afternoon, um, senators. I, uh, I just want to start by I continue to be amazed by the time you donate uh, on behalf of the state. Uh, we don't always agree on policy, but your commitment to making New Hampshire is superlative. My name is Bruce Burke. I'm a private citizen living in Pittsfield. Uh, I support uh, SB 146 for this particular measure here. I listened to a lot of testimony last week in the House about class one, class two, and class three. Uh, to my mind as a layman, it felt like they were looking for a problem that doesn't exist. And so I would like to just give you a couple statistics that I sent you this weekend. Uh, according to a recent revision energy study, RPS compliance costs of 2019 was only 0.00061%. In other words, we can have our cake and eat it too. We can incentivize our commitment to class one and class two renewables, and the cost factor is negligible. It was said much earlier in testimony today, and I, I think you all know this, we have less than 1% penetration of solar in New Hampshire. Uh, go ahead and Google solar and Maine and watch all of the contracts that are being signed up there and all the good jobs that are being created because they are moving forward with solar. The last part that I would like to say is uh, there was a Synapse Energy 2020 report called Solar Savings in New England that estimates and I know this is not exactly about this bill, but it's about solar. Behind the meter solar saved as much as 
11 cents per kilowatt hour from 2014 to 2019. And I'd like to give you two quotes and I will end my testimony. In part, it states, as a result, more TPM, uh, sorry, behind the meter solar not only decreases the quantity of electricity produced, it also reduces the price paid for electricity, which benefits all New England ratepayers, end of quote. It goes on to say from 2014, 2019, behind the meter solar created $1.1 billion in energy benefits to the six New England states. We estimate that solar contributed $87 million in public health benefits. And finally, they said it reduced CO2 emissions by 4.6 metric tons, which means nothing to me until they say it's equivalent to taking a million cars off the road. Uh, this is a complex bill, uh, but it's a really good one. Thank you for your service. I endorse 146. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your testimony. Any questions from the committee? Um, I have one, you said behind the meter it saves how much, in, uh, you said? So uh, it said uh, behind the meter, there were two stats I gave you that behind the meter, they estimate that uh, solar saved as much as 11 cents per kilowatt hour for New England from 2014 to 2019. 11 cents behind the meter. That's and I, I, sent this, I sent this link in my testimony if you want to look for it. That's great. When I write it down, I remember it better. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you. Uh, any, seeing no further questions, we appreciate your testimony. Thank you. You take care. You too. All right, Mr. Burke, like I said, we're going to have to um, yeah, yeah. bump you out here, but you should be able to rejoin no problem through the public link. Okay? Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so next up we have Susan Richmond. Um, thank you, I'm Susan Richmond. I live in Durham, I'm a private citizen. Uh, so everything Bruce Burke said with statistics to back them, I wholeheartedly agree. I just wanted to add to it that um, because the system's benefit charge would go up slowly, it means that uh, what happens in terms of people making plans to add solar uh, or thermal is predictable so that business or, or to invest in efficiency, business is more comfortable getting involved with any of those kinds of plans because they know what is up ahead. And New Hampshire also will, by um, having the systems benefit charge, begin to make real goals for how much we're going to cut back our carbon each year, which we've kind of been pretty minimal about doing it all or doing in a very small amount. And this will be a more significant amount. So that's my testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Any questions? Seeing none. Okay, next we're gonna move on to David Creer. Hi, David, welcome back. Hi, thank you. Um, I have to apologize. I wasn't slightly distracted. We are talking about part eight of SB 146, correct? Yes, I see a lot of heads, so I'll continue on. Thank you very much. Um, so this will be much shorter. Uh, David Creer, Director of Public Policy for the Businesses, Business and Industry Association of New Hampshire. Uh, we are opposing uh, part eight specifically, um, along with part three of the bill. Just wanna make that clear. We have no position on any other part. Uh, and the reason simply being is as you increase these RPS requirements for you know, anything, um, including class two, uh, that will increase the cost of electricity and a lot of large energy users will be uh, feeling that the most. Um, there was an analysis done on a similar legislation, although I fully admit this one will not have the same impact. It doesn't go quite as far. Uh, but that other legislation was $300 million a year annually uh, impact on uh, New Hampshire ratepayers. This one, like I said, would be less than that, but um, it would still be significant uh, impact on our ratepayers, specifically um, the businesses that are large energy users. Uh, with that, I will conclude so I don't get yelled at again. Did Jen yell at you? <laughs> no, she was very nice. I'm just oh, I look at I didn't even have to look up. I knew I would have to look up. 
Let's look. All right. Um, some people are just sensitive. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, any questions from the committee? See, man. Thank you very much, David. Great. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. Okay. Next up, we have Madeline Minot. Hi, Madeline. Hi, Senator. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to speak on this bill. Clean Energy New Hampshire supports part eight of SB 146. Um, the renewable portfolio standard is a very important policy in our state to support the development of renewable energy by providing a renewable energy certificate market, as well as funding for the renewable energy fund, which funds uh, a series of grant and rebate programs to support renewable energy. While most of the classes in our renewable portfolio standards are well balanced, um, we find that class two specific to solar energy, um, the goals are really low compared to the supply. Um, as I think you've already heard through um, the third quarter of 2020, we had already deployed roughly enough solar to meet 0.88% of our electricity use. Mm -hmm. And currently the goal is only to get to 0.7% by 2025. Um, we can look at our neighboring states like Massachusetts that's deployed 18% of their electricity use uh, in solar and Vermont that's over 14%. We also have a renewable energy certificate uh, rec sweeping credit. So any solar system that does not register to market their recs, their recs are automatically credited at no cost toward the obligation of energy suppliers. The amount of that credit um, last year was 0.46%. So that is making up the majority of the obligation to the suppliers. They don't even have to buy RECs or make payments uh, into the RPS. So um, when you take that into account, 0.7% obligation is really, really low. And this very low demand for solar RECs and oversupply at the same time results in a very low value for renewable energy certificates in class two in our state. So for that reason, we support adjusting upwards our goals for solar deployment and procurement in our renewable portfolio standard. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Madeline. Any questions from the committee? All right, I have one. Um, in the spirit of balance, I'm, uh, Susan uh, said something to the effect uh, in a previous testimony that the benefits charge would go up slowly how does the benefits charge counter the, um, the, the load on transmission? When, when you're, you know, people are paying for the, the benefits charge, maybe in their bill, but the, the less draw from the transmission line, there needs to, um, are you following where I'm going with this? Is, yes, there's a little bit of a mix up. So the system benefits charge um, funds energy efficiency programs and <clears throat> um, low income assistance, uh, bill assistance, it does not actually um, interact with the renewable portfolio standard. Mm -hmm. The compliance cost for the renewable portfolio standard is integrated into default energy service. Yeah. So into the energy charge of um, your bill. But um, yes, so paying into the renewable portfolio standard to encourage these renewables to be deployed in our state has many local benefits, it has economic development benefits. When we keep our energy spending local, it recirculates into our own uh, economy, but also sourcing our energy locally helps reduce the need to bring that electricity through the transmission system from far away. It reduces line losses for the electricity. When the electricity travels a very long distance, you actually lose some of that power along the way. So um, there's a lot of ways that these costs bring about savings. So I guess what I'm trying to do is quantify the benefits by reducing the transmission load versus the cost of the benefits charge locally. I, I, I'm just, I, I don't think people understand that. Um, yes, so I don't have an exact number to give you, but when we're talking about, I mentioned that our neighbors, um, Vermont have over 14% solar deployed and Massachusetts has over 18% of their electric uh, load already deployed as solar. ISO New England says that their peak demand, which is what their amount of cost of, for the regional transmission system is allocated, they're decreasing their share of peak demand while New Hampshire is the only state that is projected to continue to increase um, our peak demand. 
in part because we are not keeping up with the Joneses of the rest of New England in which we share a grid where they are deploying more distributed energy resources and they are investing more heavily in energy efficiency and demand response programs to specifically tackle those very expensive peak demand um, periods. So, uh, so for, in layman's terms, then basically, if we don't uh, take this um, this uh, uh, path towards uh, reducing the big fat transmission lines, uh, then we end up subsidizing, say, Massachusetts and Vermont that are actually utilizing the solar, uh, which they're reducing their load. We're absorbing the higher cost because we are depending more on the load. Yes, we're, we're taking on a bigger share of the regional cost of the grid because right. they're doing more to um, deploy their resources locally and invest in their local generation while we are continuing to rely more heavily on the transmission system. Right, so if for, for people that look at their, their electric bill, when they look at the, the cost, the, the greater cost of that electric bill usually is the transmission, correct? Um, it's not the largest share, but it's currently the fastest growing. Okay. I uh, just want that to be out there so that people can understand, because this can get a little complicated and uh, uh, we can get lost in the weeds in that. But uh, so Senator Waters with a question. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. And um, thank you, Madeline. And um, I'm also most appreciative, Mr. Chairman, that you're walking us through that that series of questions, because I think it gets to the heart uh, and leads to of and leads to my question. So, um, Madeline, would it be fair to say that the number that we heard recently of, from the previous testimony of three hundred million dollars that this is this is why that figure um, is almost apples and oranges and not really appropriate in terms of um, describing a cost potential cost to the people of New Hampshire. Well, first, uh, the previous speaker admitted that that was for a, an entirely different bill and not this bill. Uh, I'm not sure exactly which bill that was for, but um, often opponents of this policy will, amp will uh, artificially increase those costs by calculating the maximum possible cost. So in a, the renewable portfolio standard, there's a, uh, an effective price cap on the value of renewable energy certificate by offering suppliers that have an obligation, an alternative to make what's called an alternative compliance payment. So if the cost of, of RECs get to a certain level, they don't have to buy RECs that would be more expensive than that. They can just make a payment into a fund. And so um, they buy, to make it seem very expensive, they'll assume the worst case scenario where everybody's making that maximum uh, cost. That's not the case at all. The, the ceiling price for solar RECs is um, about $58 and solar recs have traded in New Hampshire recently in the two to $5 per rec. So um, because it's a balance of supply and demand, obviously there's a somewhat uh, unknown compliance cost because the value of recs can, can change a lot. So I think that $300 million estimate is uh, very exaggerated. Well, I'm glad we clarified that. <laughs> okay, uh, any further questions? Madeline, I really appreciate your testimony and uh, all your hard work that you do. Thank you, Senator. Okay, uh, and seeing how there's no further questions. Okay, Senator, it doesn't appear that we have anyone else for that part. So we're gonna move on to part nine. If anybody would like to speak on part nine of the bill. And I'm not seeing anybody, Senator. So part nine's okay? Part nine looks like we're good. All right, so with that. Oh, we've got one person that just popped their hands up though, uh, Cynthia Walter, if you'd like me to bring her in. Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Walter. I, I would like to speak on all nine parts very quickly. <laughs> you got three minutes. <laughs> I know, I'll try, I'll try real fast. Let me just uh, shrink my screen here. Yeah. Okay, so um, real fast, I'm a I'm scientist and uh, teach uh, for 30 years um, aquatic ecology and toxicology. So number one, section one, coastal program. We absolutely need it. I, I'm good at writing grants and I can see that we will get more federal and private grant money if we have this dedicated program. Item two, solid waste. 
We need this to protect the water under our landfills and the air above our landfills. Item three, control of PFAS. Um, New Hampshire is already na nationally famous for having PFAS in our water, our bodies, and our, our land. We do not need PFAS in our air. We need to realize that incineration converts PFAS toxins into tiny airborne particles that enter deep into the lungs. We, no matter what the cost, we have to have independent parties like the DES a man, supervise the actual real life um, stack emissions of PFAS in these incineration facilities. We, um, chemicals are not innocent until proven guilty. We have to assume they're harmful before we let them out. Um, next, zoonotic disease, um, a, a no brainer. You guys got it very clearly. Bacteria limits, please work. There's a lot of new technology um, available with studying enterobacteria um, um, processes. I've done it all over the world. Um, but we, you do want to work with the wastewater treatment operators and DES to figure out which tests are best for all. This does save lives. People do get sick from these diseases. And these are bacteria, the only way we can predict which viruses and which bacteria are in the water. So we need those um, tests and we need frequent tests to keep up that protection. Coastal cleanup, again, I'm not a no-brainer. Um, um, the food production thing, I really was convinced by the, the person you just had who's in the cheap hat that program um, that maybe you just don't need that language at all. It cuts down to, not, to only eight units that you have to evaluate. The, the rec expansion, um, so important that we do this because the extra, the peak transmission, the long transmission definitely wastes energy and wastes money. So the rec program is automatically regulate, self-regulating by cost of demand. Um, and we need those class um, two recs to grow our renewable energy economy. We're way behind our neighbors and we're losing jobs. Last one, um, a better definition of the shoreline will help both public and private land users and keep everything legal. Thank you. Amazing, well done, good job. Questions? None, seeing none, look at that. All right, well, thank you, Cynthia. We appreciate your, uh, your testimony. All right, Senator, okay. I think that is everybody that we have for the bill today. All right, does anybody need a break or are we all set to continue? So I think we just need to close the hearing first, though, Senator, officially. Right, so I'll close the hearing. <laughs> does anybody need a break uh, to stand up, stretch, or is there a motion to move into exec? I'll move exec. Is there a second? Second. Okay, Senator Waters uh, motions to move into exec. Senator Perkin Boca seconded. Let's go into roll call. Senator Gaida. Senator Gaida says yes. Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard, yes. All right. So, uh, I'd like to uh, exec uh, 114 FN, if at all possible. Discussion. Get caught up here. So, Mr. Chairman, um, or Griffin, could you direct us what we should be looking to? I see amendments here. Um, so just, yeah, so because we're discussing Senate Bill 114, um, the only pending amendments that I have um, for that bill are amendments 0220S from Senator Whitley and 0280S from Senator Whitley. Um, all of the relevant documentation for anything concerning Senate Bill 114 can be found in the OneDrive in that, in the, uh, in that bill's folder. Um, I can certainly screen share anything um, if it makes anything easier. Okay, and um, Mr. Chairman, I, I uh, if I may, just for the committee, um, I had some conversation on this bill with Director Mason 
a week or so ago and uh, with Paul Sanderson <clears throat> and also uh, some of the troopers or conservation officers, excuse me. And um, they are, you know, very pleased about the, you know, if the training is done through the police academy, you know, which is what the governor wants to do, great. Um, their concern had been, and I thought I was going to get some language by Friday, and I talked to Senator uh, Whitley about this, that they thought that the bill had a problem in that it was asking conservation officers to enforce civil statute, which, which they cannot do. Right. Yep. And so that what the agreement was, and Senator Whitley thought this made sense as well when I asked her, was to um, direct, to, to provide some language that would say that the officers, if they encounter such things, would inform, inform the appropriate authorities about that incident. So, you know, I mean, obviously if there's somebody who's threatening or, you know, an assault or something like that, but for the civil, the civil enforcement here that she mentions in the bill, they can't do. But that, and so I, again, I thought I was gonna get that language and I didn't. Um, I think it is forthcoming, so I don't know. I, I guess I'm asking that maybe we, if we could wait till next Monday, but I know we're getting jammed up. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much, uh, I'm getting at, uh, uh, pretty uh, hard pressed to get some stuff passed. Um, I would entertain a motion for re-refer if you, if that, if you're comfortable with that, we can, uh, you know, work on it again and, and later on. Senator um, Amard. One second, um, and uh, SB 96, I know that, that they're working on that in, in the Senate ju Judiciary. So, um, uh, you know, they're, I was just, you know, thinking about it and it could probably upend some of the work that they're doing already on. So I'm wondering if we just re-refer it and work on it again at a little at a time. Uh, but Senator Perkins Coker, you, you were gonna make a statement? I just wanted to let you know that Senator Whitley is watching and is available to answer questions. I I think Senator Waters that the language in her amendments might address your concern, but I didn't know if we could let her into comment. Yeah, I'd like to hear from everybody in the committee first. Okay. Senator Gray, I already suggest you. <laughs> I'm ready to hear from Senator Whitley. Okay. Senator Guida? I'll wait to hear from Senator Whitley. All right, so let's bring on Senator Whitley. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Oh, great. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate you um, hearing from me. For the record, my name is Becky Whitley and I represent New Hampshire Senate District 15. So uh, I just, I think that, you know, I'm fine with adding additional language, but I do think that the amendment that was submitted is pretty clear that we are not uh, asking for them to enforce uh, anything civilly related. I, I, we, we did hear that concern from the departments and so believe that the amendment that you have before you adequately addresses that. Concern. Which amendment number is that please? 0280S. Thank you. 0280S. And we also, I just want to note too that we worked very closely with Chief Skippa from the Police uh, Training and Council, the Police Academy, um, who thought the language looked good also. So I just want to let you know that we worked very closely with him and uh, this bill reflects uh, our conversations with him. It was an agreement, agreed upon language. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I may, I and looking at this and thinking about my conversation with Sanderson, um, I think um, Senator Whitley is right because it does say that, okay, you know, they should protect folks under RSA 354B, but what that protection means, the department's gonna figure out in its review of guidelines. And I, and I think that's just where they could determine, well, okay, if you're under this, you know, since you may or may not be empowered to make an arrest under this circumstances, 
here's what you do. And I, so I, I do think that, um, you know, in looking at this after that conversation, I, I think we're, we're good to go on it. And this, this does take care of that one concern. And I don't think that it conflicts in any way with the, um, what may be coming out of um, the other committee about the training standards, because it simply is referencing those. Yeah, so if I may address that also. So I'm on Judiciary Committee, who's and also a co-sponsor of SB 96. Um, and it, you know, we are addressing different issues in SB 96. Uh, and what we discussed with the stakeholders about this training that we've uh, added in the amendment that uh, we worked on with Chief Skippa is that the training is only referenced in the ex governor's executive order and through rules. And so all the stakeholders, including law enforcement, so including Chief Skippa, thought it was incredibly important to have this in statute. And so that was why that uh, was added at the bottom of this amendment to reflect the will of the governor and to reflect the will of uh, where law enforcement is going on this issue. So uh, the commission officers or conservation officers already go through this training as far as uh, the things that are outlined in here. Uh, what, what about this personal database or the, uh, an identified database shall not contain any personal information but the department shall have another database on this or could you explain that? Yep, so the idea is to be consistent with the transparency that the LIAC Commission discussed all summer. So the biggest thrust of the LIAC Commission was just to create transparency. So now we have a situation where we know these incidents are happening anecdotally all over the state. They're just not tracked. And so the idea is just to create and gather, create this database and to gather information. This again is very consistent with the work that's happening with, all, with law enforcement all over the state. So it's just a way to gather data, which I think you know, we can all agree is important to have, particularly as legislators to address issues, to have all the data available to us. All right. Questions from the committee? Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think we're putting the cart before the horse here. I would rather see some data produced that justifies changing the training regimen of every police department in the state, possibly at significant cost, as well as the training regimen of, of uh, police standards and training. So the way I live and the way I try to make my decisions, show me the data. I hear that it's happening all over the state, but I haven't seen it in any of the parks I've been to. This is in, in, the, in the words of the sponsor. Uh, so uh, I think, again, we're gonna change the paradigm of every police department in the state for something for which we have no data, only hearsay and, and, and if you will, um, possibly, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking empirical data, but there is none at this point. And so I think we should first collect the data that says it's a problem worth solving before we start harnessing our police departments and our enforcement agencies with something that might not rise to the level of complete and total uh, inclusion uh, of, um, of an entirely new protocol. Thank you. Senator, thank you for that question too. I, I think the idea is that that's exactly what we're trying to do with this bill. I think we heard some significant testimony that folks feel uh, through historic, um, for historic reasons, people feel like they can't report these issues. And so we're doing exactly as you suggested, gathering this data. And the reality is, is that this training is already, uh, it's it's going to, it's, it's happening. It's going through rulemaking right now. This is just putting it in statute. So there is no additional cost that's already happening. The governor has committed resources to it. So this bill doesn't create any new requirements in terms of the training. And would we consider, if I may, Mr. Chairman, the question, uh, would, would we consider removing the parts of the bill that specify that the training will take place since it's already being covered? Well, I'm hesitant to do that because that was an agreement with Chief Skippa from the police academy. He suggested that portion. I don't represent the police academy, I represent the citizens of the state. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Senator Waters. Yeah, um, you know, as always, I appreciate Senator Guida's um, caution about what we're acting on and what information we have. And, and I guess what I would kind of say on this one is two things. One is a, you know, higher view of what the LEACT report went through, and I'm sure Senator Guy's read the LEACT report and then all that documentation they had 
and testimony behind it. And it's a very impressive um, document. And, uh, and the governor, you know, went, looked at that and said, okay, there are some things that we're probably ready, ready to do. And then moving forward, you know, we'll have to know a whole lot more um, so that, you know, is our training working? You know, I mean, those kinds of questions and uh, what trends are developing in, in these areas that law enforcement's got to know about. And so what I see in this bill is that it really is, um, you know, right in step with what is being, you know, what the governor uh, wants to do and what the REACT report proposes. And then in particular in the parks and, and these grounds, um, that, you know, this is, an, this is an interesting and overlapping area of enforcement because we got local police, we got conservation officers, state police and so forth. So I think the bill is really just calling for consistency across these various law enforcement bodies and making sure that it's inclusive to, to track with what the, you know, the governor has set in motion. So, but I, I understand what you're saying, Senator Guy, I, I, I get it, but I, th I think this one's ready to go. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yeah, I just wanted to add to those comments. You know, I agree. This is the direction we're seeing all of our other law enforcement recommendations across the state moving. And I know personally that this was a very collaborative process that a lot of parties had input on. And so respectfully, you know, I, I certainly understand the concerns, but um, especially given that the concern is to put in a requirement that you know was essentially approved by by the people that need to enact and implement that requirement i mean um it seems to me that this is a fully baked and very sophisticated piece of legislation that as senator water says is entirely consistent with what the lee act commission found which we all know was also a very thorough process senator gaida senator gaida you're you're muted I'm going to I'm going to withhold my comments for the moment. I'll I'll speak later. Okay. Senator Gray, um, I, I support the bill the way it's amended by O two eight O S. I think it's consistent with what the Act Committee did. Um, I think that there are people who do have uh, systemic bias out there, and that uh, we need to. Uh, to work towards a uh, society that uh, is tolerant of uh, all the people that are listed here. Okay, is there anybody to entertain a motion? I'll move up to pass on the amendment. Second. Okay, let's do a roll call. How about some further discussion? Oh, for, oh yeah, let's do it, discuss. If I may, Mr. Chairman. Senator Guy. Yeah. You'll note the testimony of DNCR. They are not favoring this bill. Okay. Um, as well, if in the, in the words of the sponsor, the bill has no financial impact, why is it an FN bill? If this stuff's already paid for elsewhere. Uh, I am greatly concerned uh, that this bill will create more work and not really resolve the problem uh, because you're trying to use criminal enforcement um, uh, personnel to discern attitudes that are carried forth uh, through civil civil laws, uh, as is stated by the by the police departments. Um, and uh, again, I I know that the police already undergo significant training uh, and. Um, that that training more than equips them to deal with this already. All right, so I would support a database. Um, I would also uh, um, challenge the possibility that the information might be personally identifiable because it's going to come from possibly interviews with individuals. If something rises to the point of being criminal in a way if it's threatening, as opposed to unpleasant or uh, offensive, then there's a criminal statute and a criminal code in place to deal with that. 
But if what we're trying to do here is to eliminate things that are unpleasant, we're going to be making laws into eternity. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't support prejudice or bias, and I certainly don't practice it. And I fear that we're, we're walking down a road that's going to continue to further and further and further define what it is that's permissible and what is not. What's offensive to one is not offensive to another. And for those reasons, uh, I'm going to vote against this bill. Thank you. Senator Perkins, Quokka. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just want to respectfully point out that um, the DNCR objections to this bill were to the version um, prior to the amendment and that Senator Whitley did work with um, DNCR to have the language in the amendment that they approved. And I appreciate your comments, Senator Gaida, but I do want to point out that what may merely seem threatening or offensive to one person may feel criminal to another. And, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure that all of our citizens feel protected. And we did hear testimony to that effect. If I may respond, Mr. Chairman. Hello. Uh, taking offense is not a criminal act. Giving offense is not a criminal act. And trying to shape societal values with laws is a very dangerous precipice upon which we stand. Thank you. It's called social engineering. Further discussion. I just got to put in my input, and I'm, I'm I'm following on the lines of Senator Gaida as well. I I do believe that we're becoming um, we're we're marking a, a new territory where speech, uh, even unpleasant speech, uh, is is um, going to be threatened. We do have a First Amendment. We also have a Fourteenth Amendment, which provides equal protection under the law. And uh, if those are violated, obviously, then uh, there's, they need to be addressed. But I think we're becoming a police state by, by adding more and more regulations on people and keeping databases. Uh, yeah, may, may not be personally identifiable, but uh, you know, there are companies out there that aggregate and they can take information and they can, they can narrow it down. I just don't like, uh, I, I don't like the fact that people are going to be monitoring every action that we make in our society. And I think this just goes too far. I do believe that the police training should be sufficient. I believe that uh, there's, um, there needs to be balance in our, in our society. Um, but I don't like people uh, going out there trying to judge motives by, by a standard that, uh, that is, is on shifting sand and it keeps moving. Uh, it is my humble opinion that this, this takes us down a slippery slope that I do not want to follow. I do believe in our First Amendment, and I do believe it protects ugly speech, and there's plenty of it out there, uh, but uh, it is protected. I also believe that the 14th Amendment also protects everybody equally, and if that is unended, if it is not, if it is not followed to the uh, the letter of the law, then, then, then that, that needs to be addressed and it needs to be uh, uh, dealt with, but uh, everybody should be treated equally. Um, there are plenty of things that people do that offend me, plenty of things, uh, but I, I don't want a database on them. I don't. So uh, for that purpose, I'm, I'm going to be voting against this personally, but uh, uh, we'll, uh, I'm going to vote now. So with that, um, we'll go further. Uh, so shall we do a roll call or are we already in roll call? So Senator Waters moved uh, to, to pass and Senator Perkins Quokka uh, seconded. And so we'll start with the roll with Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Perkins Quokka. Yes. Senator Gaida. No. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Avard, no. I'll move up to pass as amended. Okay. Uh, is there a second? Second. Okay. So we'll start the roll with uh, Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Perkins Quokka. Yes. Senator Gaida. No. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Avard, no. Senator Waters, would you like to take this out? Uh, sure. And, um, Senator, if I might say, what an interesting debate we had over this, you know, and it's going to be an interesting debate on the floor, isn't it? You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, sure. these are, you know, really, really interesting issues. And uh, of course, the problem for me is I, I can see both sides so well. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see. 
It's yeah. good. It's good. Absolutely. And we can do it amicably as well. So next we'll look at, uh, I believe, Senator 771. I think that is... Is that... Do we have all the amendments on 71 ready? Or have we... Everybody have them available? Look at them. This is uh, Senator Waters' bill. My computer just shut down. <laughs> Go ask me a second. Is it? I, I don't. Is this mine? <laughs> I'll tell you. Let me open it up here. This is a uh, Senator Sherman's. Sherman uh, oh yeah, this one. Okay. <laughs> it's been a long day, Mr. Chairman. Oh, yes, I can be taught though. I can. I can be taught. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, discussion. Anybody want to talk about 71? Well, um, Mr. Chairman, I guess that we, the, the last thing we had, we have a couple of amendments, mine from, that I think I, you know, worked out with Bradley and others um, and discussed with you and others. Um, so I guess just for purpose of discussion, I'll move amendment 0245S. Okay. Discussion? Is there a second on that? Am I alone? For discussion purposes, I'll second it. There we are. I guess, we, should we vote on that? Well, I'll just, just to speak to it. I mean, because I, I mean, you know, we had a lot of good discussion of this and I tried to incorporate in this amendment um, everything that Senator Guida had had suggested in terms of the composition of yeah. the board there. And then Senator um, Guida, you know, just a note to just refresh people's um, memories on it. Um, and then we had a discussion about, you know, what kind of vehicles and who would best represent the, you know, do, do the, the heavy, the truckers, and the snowmobilers, well, NHADA represents them and they're you know, on it. So you know, we made some of those changes. And then I think more substantively, Senator Guida wanted to make sure that we had in the language for the um, commission that cost benefits language. It was up there in the public goods statement or wherever it was, but it, it, Senator Guida wanted to make sure that was down as well explicitly that the cost benefits <coughs> were part of the duties of the commission. So um, in a nutshell, that's what this amendment um, does and I, and I guess I believe I'd sh I'd shared a draft of it with um, with, uh, with with folks earlier and I I, I think Senator Guida thought that maybe he was going to do something else too so um, you know for purposes of the discussion we'll hear well I mean I haven't looked at his amendment yet we'll hear about it but um, that's just why this one's here for the discussion Senator Guida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the, the Senator Waters um, amendment, uh, but it does not go near far enough in addressing the different business sectors that will be impacted uh, by uh, the sweeping reforms um, uh, that this bill could produce. Um, the snowmobile dealers are represented by the ADA, but not the Snowmobile Association. That's $600 million a year of the state economy. Um, farmers, methane, okay, while many would consider it humorous, in fact, it is a consideration that will be met. Uh, I, I just think that the balance on the commission, even with the amendments made by Senator Waters, isn't sufficient. Uh, I also, I'm trying to find in the amendment this specific language relative to, and it's probably because I'm not seeing it, relative to specifically requiring a detailed cost benefit analysis on the affected business sectors. Um, again. So uh, I will be opposing the amendment. I, I, I applaud Senator Waters' efforts, uh, but I don't believe they go far enough to balance the commission um, so that not only are those who have the academic and scientific um, perspective uh, able to voice and shape potential public policy, but those who are in fact affected by that policy can participate in shaping the arguments, not just responding to them. So for those reasons, I'll be voting uh, against this amendment. 
Any further discussion? I'm just, I'm sorry that I'm trying to steer. I'm doing down. the same thing, Dave. I'm, I'm squinting. And, <laughs> I know, Bob. It's like, yeah, whose eyes are getting worse here, right? <laughs> Would it, I just offer this. Did anybody want me to share um, Senator Waters' amendment on the screen and blow it up? Only if you blow it up, because every time I see it on the screen, I'm still squinting. Like All that. right, hold on. <laughs> Everybody see that okay? Mm -hmm. Scroll down. Uh, you know, I'm not seeing that language either, Bob, and that is really, <coughs> I don't know whether I had a different. It, it, you know, it might be contained in section one of the original bill. Yeah, but was. that language was, was nowhere near specific enough. All right, sir. Mr. Chairman, um, yeah. well, if I could ask Senator Guido, what do you have in your amendment? Uh, I've added a, a number of uh, other uh, 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 commission members and specifically language that's very explicit on the requirement for a detailed economic impact statement. Well, why don't we pull up, business Mr. Chairman, why don't we pull up Bob's amendment then? And um, maybe that's the way we'll go. So I, I don't, I can withdraw my, emo my motion for now. Okay, motion uh, withdrawn, is that seconded? I I'll withdraw a second. So okay. uh, let's let's look at Bob's and um, you know, I I don't know whether I'm going to be able to see the ex exact so, changes, but maybe you could walk us through it, Senator Guider. Oh, three twenty one S. Yeah. All right. I'm going to expand it on my screen here. All right. So what we do, we add New Hampshire Timberland Owners Association. Why? Yeah. Obviously, they're, they're involved with the ecosystem, but they're also involved with the timber industry, which, as we know, is already struggling, uh, uses big equipment, um, and would be affected in terms of its operating costs. New Hampshire Farm Bureau, representing farmers, big equipment, methane from cattle, those types of things. Mm -hmm. uh, home Heating Association, right? It's going to have an impact on heating costs, and Home Heating Association is, is um, uh, you know, knowledgeable uh, about uh, methodologies, costs, and so forth. Consumer Energy Alliance, uh, that's a regional organization that includes New Hampshire um, that discusses energy issues and, and uh, represents as well uh, the airlines, Airlines for America, who will be impacted by this. Um, business aviation industry, uh, as you know, we, uh, we passed my legislation that dramatically improved the arcane and exorbitant costs of registering aircraft in the state. Um, and uh, it has had actually started to produce uh, new arrivals, but business aircraft, commercial aircraft, uh, you know, non-airline, uh, off-highway vehicle association, right, snowmobile association, marine trades. Those are all industry sectors that have a significant stake in whatever energy policies developed. And those are folks who rather than be, uh, you know, respondents to um, proposed laws, I believe, should have a voice in actually shaping those laws uh, responsibly. Uh, none of those organizations are opposed to improving our air and our, our quality, uh, but they all, uh, you know, have, have to live in the real world of expenses and bottom lines and, and industries and, and train changes to demographics and, and uh, uh, changes in, in economic conditions such as COVID and so forth, the impacts of those things. So for those reasons, I've added those. Can I ask a quick question? To, to yes, sir. Um, so, um, you know, it's it's going to be big, but hey, um, there we are. So, um, I, I, it's just very hard for me to see what I may have added that you didn't add, or if I, I think there's a little overlap. But I'd be good with this list, just so long if Griffin could do the sort through to see if any of the people that I put on are could be added to this as well. Well, no, this is not. This is not excluding yours. This is in addition no, no. to yours. Well, I mean, but it's uh, not, not in addition to my amendment, maybe. That's why I was asking. Yeah, I certainly have no no problem with, with doing that. Um, uh, and then, uh, again, this is not meant to be exclusive. I, my intent was that everyone that you had on there would be fine, and these folks would be added as well. Yes, it is right. cumbersome, but we're talking about a policy yeah, yeah, that affects yeah, yeah. every aspect of no, every I, life. I, I think, again, I'm sorry to throw this on Griffin, but it's awfully hard 
you know, doing it this way otherwise. But, um, you know, I think that your list looks good. It's going to be a big commission, but, you know, I think you're absolutely right philosophically. Let's get everybody in the same room and they're going to contribute some important information, especially the airlines folks I hadn't thought about so much, but for sure. Um, and so, uh, you know, if we could just make sure that what I had in my amendment is added into Bob's, then, um, you know, but why don't you continue with the rest of it? Sure. And then you look at the Roman nine on line 22. It's very specific, right? Uh, all recommendations for changes to standards shall include a comprehensive economic analysis of their impact on affected business sectors of the New Hampshire economy and an estimate of the cost of such proposed changes to the average New Hampshire household. At the end of the day, what we're going to do is going to cost us um, uh, at least for a while, uh, while we're in transition, uh, additional. Uh, I, you know, I know my own energy costs I consider to be exorbitant, but we grin and bear it with the highest or second or third highest energy costs in the nation. Um, and and uh, so then that study, it, it provides specific requirements, quantifying separately the emissions generated from sources outside the state and the emissions generated within the state. And I think DES can probably give us a pretty good assessment of how much of our, of our air quality uh, degradation is provided by, if you will, uh, the Midwest and, and uh, the, uh, the westerly winds that bring all this garbage in, into the East Coast and, and out over the Atlantic. And then B, measuring the relative impact of any New Hampshire standards or goals on the combined total of New Hampshire emissions generated within and outside the state. In other words, what are these, what are these um, proposed goals going to do in, ter in terms of impacting the actual real air quality? Um, in terms of, you know, are, are we going to be the flea on the back of the elephant while China's building a new coal-fired plant every two weeks? Uh, Indonesia, India, Russia, China, um, and Brazil uh, are, are, are just pouring millions of tons of stuff into the air. Is, is the cost to our state in terms of its economy and the quality of life, uh, if you will, I should say the economics of family households, going to actually be better given that you know, perhaps the impact of the changes we're proposing are going to be minuscule because most of what we're breathing is not in our own control. Well, good question. Um, can I ask a question, um, Mr. Chairman of, of, of Senator Guida? Yes. Yeah, so um, thank you, Bob. And um, so just one uh, suggestion in the spirit of what we're trying to do on line 24. Um, sure. Could we say of the cost and benefits of such proposed changes because one thing in, in the commission as it was, you know, the ad hoc commission this summer, DES has, has uh, and some health studies have pretty interesting specific data on the health costs and it's hundreds of millions of dollars in particular areas of the state that have higher measures of emissions, you know, all the lung diseases and just, you know, asthma, just what you'd imagine, right? So that I just thought that um, if we're asking them to do to look at all these impacts and these studies, that um, you know that that uh, you know there's cost because you know say hey fuel might get more expensive who knows right, um, but the benefits might be that you're not taking kid to the doctor you're not getting cancer or you know emphysema or God knows what so um, if we could add and benefits there I think that would be you know useful. I don't have a problem with that. Again, I, I, we're here, we're looking for facts and data. Yeah, yeah, and for accuracy. sure. So I don't have a problem with that change. All right. Well, again, Griffin, if you keep in notes. Senators, I have a question, if I may. Um, with regards to the commission, I think it's been a while since I've, I've been on one or near one or saw one. And uh, just so that they're fair and they're evenly handed, uh, how, how is this going to run? How is this going to play out? Yeah, how does the commission, uh, who, who, who runs it, uh, how does everybody get an equal share in the say uh, so that there's balance? Um, I don't even know if that's a fair question or not, but if somebody- oh, this, the, I mean, if I'll, I'll say something, others can chime in. I mean, I think that's the essential question um, yeah. in that, um, you know, I have tended to find that commissions tend to be really nonpartisan and see their duty as to be open and to give everybody a voice and to be heard 
and to present their testimony and their consideration. And that's one good thing about, you know, what Senator Guida is mentioning is you, you give these people a seat at the table and they're going to make sure that happens. And I, and again, I have my, you know, Senator Gray and Senator Guida speak to this too, but, you know, I have found the legislators in particular on these commissions make sure, you know, I really want to make sure that happened because they see, you know, I think we tend to see it as our, our duty to the public, that whatever our opinions may be, our duty as the Republic to have commissions be open in that way. Um, I suppose not all the time, but you know, I mean, I think that's, that's always the way I've run mine. And uh, so good question. All right, just, I, it's just out there. I just wanna make sure that, uh, it, you know, we, we pass these things and, and it goes through that, that everybody does have equal footing uh, so that, that every voice is heard, that's all. I, I just, I care for the balance and I, I wanna hear all, both sides and all sides actually, so that we can come to an informed decision. So I, um, there were a couple amendments uh, um, that I wanted in there, which had to do with the uh, early on. Are those going to be included, Griff? So we've got a lot of changes happening here. So what we are doing is it appears blending Senator Guida's Amendment 0321S with Senator Avard's Amendment, uh, I'm sorry, Senator Waters Amendment 0245S. Senator Avard, you offered an amendment early on, 0103S, that added two members to the commission from the New Hampshire Motor Transport Association and the Energy Marketers Association of New Hampshire. Both of those- sorry. Oh, Can you hear, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Both of those members are included in Senator Waters' amendment. So if Senator Waters' amendment was blended with Senator Guida's amendment, you would add, the, you would still carry over those two members that you had originally suggested. So it's in there. It, in, it yes, in so many words, you're good. It used to be a commercial, whatever. It's in there. It's in there. <laughs> I can't help myself. The only other, the I guess the only other question I have in looking at both of these amendments is that I know Senator Gata has a more comprehensive um, economic analysis with the addition of and benefits, yep. but Senator Waters, your um, amendment on page two, lines. 24 and 25 appear to conflict somewhat. Um, I didn't, uh, you, that, that language says the commission shall receive testimony to better understand the cost and benefits associated with science-based emissions reduction in New Hampshire and the neighboring states. So the question I have before I, if, if with this passes is what language I guess are we going with? Oh, I, I, guess, Bob, it, I guess Bob, I guess Bob kind of was in there. I just didn't see it. <laughs> Uh, yeah, can you say that again, Griffin? So, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. So this language in Senator Waters Amendment 0245S, page two, lines 24 and 25 reads, the commission shall receive testimony to better understand the costs and benefits associated with science-based emissions reduction in New Hampshire and in neighboring states. Right. I would say that's far too vague. And that was one of the reasons I put my specific language in. Um, it doesn't require a report to be delivered on the impact. It says shall receive knowledge, receive information. Okay. Um, and so uh, I think as, as, since we're looking at changing public policy, we need to have a written part of the, of the um, report dedicated to the potential impacts and benefit, you know, costs and benefits economically. And so I think my, I would, I would be happy with my language. Again, yeah. Where are we again uh, on mine? Okay. So I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Senator. So you're looking at from your amendment 0245S, page okay. two, lines 24 and 25. Okay, so, and, and Senator Guida, um, you're not changing. I mean, you see on mine, if you can toggle back to that, Senator Guida. Hang on. All right. So, um, number, you know, on page two, line 20. Page two, line, line 20. 20. Whoops, where are we here? Am I in the right one? Yeah. You, are you 0245? Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. I'm looking at line 20 on that. Yeah. Talks so about mileage. So just, you know, legislative members get their mileage. Right. And we've got four. Committee may solicit input and receive public testimony. Um, then we've got five. They're going to hear testimony. And this is where you're, this is what Griffin mentioned. So um, I don't see, I mean, I, maybe we don't need this one then. I, I think it's nice to have science-based emissions reduction, you know, but that's not really relevant to. Um, I, I agree with you, uh, Dave, but I also yeah. think that we got to balance the science with the, with the economics yeah. um, and receiving testimony to better understand in no way requires. Yeah, so let's, let's replace, let's pull five then Griffin. Okay. Got it. And um, so you're good still Senator Guida because the way you put your amendment together, six is, six is still okay with you in my language. Like yeah, I mean, that's the purpose of having this commission, right? Yeah. It says committee, but I think it meant commission, correct? On, on the Roman six on line 26. Yeah, there's a there's a type, there's a correction for you, Griffin. Do you see that? I see it. Okay. And then uh, the definitions in that section of public health and emissions. Um, and then eight, they got elected chair. And then we go into yours, right? At that point. Senator Guide is kind of going there, right? On on the Yeah, we're, we're, well, we're adding members and then we're adding a, a couple of provisions regarding you know, the yeah. financial, uh, the economic aspects. All right. So I, I think what I'm trying to say, Griffin, is that pull that Roman five, my cost and benefits, and stick in guide as where it should go in this list of all these other things. Yep. So the only three changes I'm seeing are we're basically blending the two amendments together. We are removing um, paragraph five in your amendment, Senator Waters. We are striking committee on line 26 and replacing it with commission and adding the quote, the term and benefits on line 24 of Senator Guida's amendment. So I think we're good. I and think we're good. So I'll move the committee amendment. Senator Ray Barton. Yes, Senator uh, Gray. I'll, I'll second that. Um, I've been very quiet. <clears throat> I believe that uh, this commission probably will not be useful or needed because I think that there's going to be legislation come out at the federal level, which are going to make a lot of the things that you're trying to do here moot. Um, and for those that uh, talked about uh, commissions, I was on the 5G commission uh, which uh, ended this uh, past year, and uh, it did uh, certainly attract people who were very <laughs> set in their ways about whether 5G was good or not, and uh, it was a very lonely experience <laughs> when I tried to explain to them um, why some of the anecdotal evidence that they were looking at, like a picture of a tree with foliage removed on one side and saying that that antenna that was there caused it when on um, my work, a way to work or in, in the Senate, there was a new antenna that was put up and they removed a tree that was next to a particular tree. And it was almost identical to the picture that was taken and that antenna hadn't even gone in service yet. So again, I, you know, some of these commissions, yeah, it's, it's a good thought. Gee, you know, we want to protect the environment. We want to protect, you know, the air. Uh, but there's a lot of those uh, senators and representatives down in Washington that are going to preempt a lot of the things I think you might accomplish with the, this commission. 
Uh, and I think that, you know, you may also attract people from one side of the issue more than you'll attract on the other side. So I'm not a, uh, a big person that's in favor of, of this commission for that particular, those particular reasons. Thank you, Senator Gray. And I, I, I dub you as the Columbo of the Senate. The only thing that's missing is a cigar. But uh, and I really do appreciate your, uh, your um, insight. Um, but right now we're working on the amendments. So if, uh, if, if, if we can at least agree to, to blend those with whatever's made, and then we'll, we'll take a vote on that, if that's OK. Uh, so Griffin, can you just give a, a rehearsal as to? Uh, sure. So these are, this is going to be very complicated, but I'll try to make it as short and sweet as possible. We are taking 0245S, Senator Waters Amendment, and Senator Guida's Amendment 0321S, blending them together and removing certain provisions from each amendment. In Senator Waters Amendment 0245S, we are removing paragraph five. On page two, lines 24 to 25. And we are also making uh, uh, a correction on line 26, where it says committee, changing that to commission. Going over to Senator Guida's amendment, we are going to line 24, where it says an estimate of the cost of such proposed changes, we are adding and benefits. So those are the three changes between the two amendments. They're going to be blended together. And I'm sure that if OLS has any concerns or sees any um, issues with the language, I am sure I will be talking to each of you about it. <laughs> All right. So that being said, uh, is it premature to vote on the bill? without having to see what all else puts out or we all said so we, would, we would just make it uh, the motion was made by Senator Waters seconded by Senator Guida for this committee amendment so I would draft it with um, Senate mean. Energy and Natural Resources make sure that it comes out the way that the committee intended and if there are any problems I'd share it with you guys and we would address it on the Senate floor. Sounds good so let's start with uh, uh, a motion uh, or a vote and we'll start with uh, Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Gray. No. Uh, Senator Avard, yes. And so now, is there another motion? You want to do it, Bob? Move out to pass as amended. I'll uh, second. Okay, and let's start off with Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Waters. Yep. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yep. Senator Gray. No. I'm conflicted, but yes. <laughs> All right. And so who would like to take this out? Senator Waters would like to take <laughs> it. <laughs> Senator Waters. Well, um, I was, I, Bob, I thought we could really, you know, shock the Senate <laughs> and you could take it out. <laughs> they say, oh, God, God, God has gone over to the dark side. <laughs> you sure, Bob? Come on. You know, I mean, people mistake us for each other because of our prominent domes anyways, man. <laughs> well, if uh, our if, um, or Senator Perkins quote, do you want to do it? I mean, I don't. I don't oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Anybody want to take this out? Sure. All right, Senator Perkins Quoka will take this out and congratulations. Oh, thank you. Yeah. All right. So all the questions will be directed to you. You can be sure of that. Uh, Griffin? Yes. Uh, do we have time for one more? Are we are we running out of time? No, I, I, I think we're good. I just want we wanted to conclude our public hearing by four o'clock. Um, I think you had mentioned that you wanted to exec one more bill today, and that was Senate Bill 115. Oh, yeah. I do have a hard stop at five, Chairman. I have to go pick up my daughter. Okay. Uh, for some reason, I'm already locked out on my computer again. Um, 115. Discussion? 
<laughs> I don't remember what it is. What is this? So one? Semba, one, Semba 115 is establishing greenhouse gas emission reduction goals for the state and establishing a climate action plan. This was primed by Senator Prentice. I, 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 I don't remember. I, mean, I haven't read that. <laughs> That's good that you said that. Thank you. Senator Gaida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> You know, I, I have a real concern. When you look at the findings part of this bill, it is so utterly over the top. Okay. Um, and I don't believe for a second that it expresses the intent or the will of the legislature, despite its proclamation to the contrary. And um, I also think, again, uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Uh, our, our energy policy in the country, our gasoline prices, where I am, already up 15%. And it's going to go higher. So we just keep piling on the climate change piece with what I consider to be hyperbolic language in the findings to try to justify something that's not necessary at this point in time. I think I would rather wait until this commission study gets done. Okay. And then we can look at establishing limits, uh, greenhouse gas goals and emissions and so forth. So uh, for those reasons, I'm gonna be voting against this bill. Senator Gray, do you have comments? Um, why isn't this a part of the bill we just discussed? It's an emission. I, I don't see why this isn't part of that bill and one of them done away with. It's a little redundant, you think? Senator Waters? Oh, I just think we'll have a ITL motion and it'll be three to two. So are we gonna surprise anybody, folks? So, so Mike, well, you know, I, I wanna give everybody a chance to speak. I know, I appreciate I appreciate that. Senator Perkins Polka. <laughs> Similar to Senator Waters, I mean there is a climate action plan proposed in this bill, so there is some difference, but all right, do I have a motion? Oh, Senator Gray, comment? Um, is there a problem with the, the two senators that support the bill with uh, uh, having the last bill reconsidered and uh, adding your plan into that one and acting, you know, as a study of that plan and uh, acting on the whole thing in one? Well, well th thank you, Senator Gray, for asking that and considering it. Um, I think that they are pretty substantially different in a way in that the climate action plan here is actually much more comprehensive than the study on emissions in the uh, other one. And um, I mean, I, th I think you understand that there's some folks, you know, I mean, the, the heart of this bill is certainly the setting those, those, those goals and they're kind of in accordance with what may be becoming national, but, you know, I was so impressed with your confidence a few minutes ago that Washington was gonna, Washington was gonna do anything. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, that aside, I, I, I think that these are really quite different and I think it would create problems for the other one if we tried to graft uh, that that commission also had to come up with a whole climate action plan. The last one we did was about hundred pages and, um, you know, lots of stuff in there and so on. So. Uh, and I think, you know, the governor also is setting up this Department of Energy and he's folding OSI into it, which, you know, the planning side of things. And so I, I think we're going to see something emerge there in terms of planning functions on climate that'll, you know, be, be useful and what the governor is likely to want. And that counts, right? So I, I just assume we keep them separate. All right. Is there a motion on the floor? I'll move ITL. Is there a second? Second. All right, we'll uh, do a roll call, Senator Gaida. Yeah, if I may speak first. Yes. Again, the ITL here is not because we're not interested in studying it, it's because I think we're starting to see redundancy in commissions and, and policy and so forth. Um, and so uh, again, this is not an expression of lack of interest in, in, in addressing issues. It's just, we're creating commissions and committees and so forth beyond our capability to manage. So for that reason, I'm gonna, I moved ITL and I will vote yes on the ITL motion. Senator Gray. I'm good. 
That's a yes. Correct? Oh, I didn't know we were voting yet. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, I'm I'm in favor of the ITL. All right. Okay, Senator Perkins Quoka. No, an ITL. All right. Senator Waters. No. Senator Avard, yes. Um, Senator Gray, would you like to take this out? Fine. All right. And let's we'll get that, to there... see how Griffin writes this up. Oh, Griffin is, he, he needs a raise. Ladies and gentlemen, talk to your, uh, get this guy a raise. He's, he's amazing. Um, so is there a motion to move out of exec? I'll move, move it. Second. Second. All right, Senator Waters moves to move out of exec. Senator Gaida agrees. And so we'll start with Senator Waters. Yes. Senator Gaida. Yes. Senator Gray. Yes. Senator Perkins Quoka. Yes. Senator Avard. Yes. Well done, folks. Everybody, before before everybody leaves, I just and I know you have to go in just a few moments, Senator uh, Perkins Quoka. Uh, just to reiterate, um, the FN deadline will be next week. So there are two, I believe, FN bills remaining in committee. That's the one that we heard today, Senate Bill One Forty Six, and then we have your bill potentially next week, Senator Waters, um, renewable energy procurement, I believe. Um, so all FN bills will need to be exact at the end of Monday's meeting. So if there are any amendments or anything like that. Can I ask Griffin, if I may, I sent an email to Senator Avard and to you earlier. I, I, I just, I, I'm a little anxious about, you know, Senate Bill 151 is a big bill and we're gonna have a lot of testimony on it. Um, I and I just wondered whether we would be able to have another session a little bit later on in the week to exec it or I mean, but Mr. Chairman, it's your call, but I just I wanted to point that out. Um, you know, you've read the you've seen the bill, right? Yeah, if everybody's agreeable, I'm, 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 I mean, it's, I'm up to, it's up to you. But I, I mean, I, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen with that bill. I, I, you know, we put a lot of work into it, but um, and the utilities are all on board as far as I know, but uh, anyhow, just it's just awfully hard to think that we're gonna be able to, you know, kind of digest everything in that hearing and exec it right after, but, you know, we gotta do what we gotta do, so. Um, yeah, and Senator Waters, I, I'm, I'm probably gonna have to bend your ear a little bit on section three a little bit on uh, the bill that we heard today. Oh to gosh, yeah, I mean, it's been bent. So we'll, let's talk, uh, Senator Avard, about yeah. um, what we did today, because there's a lot that's in that bill that was going to, especially that section. Yeah, I, I gonna I, just have to go bye bye or or get changed. And um, other, you know, so I'll, I'll try to go over what we heard today and see what we can do to get something together that um, yep. that people want to support. And otherwise, I, I mean, that's the only section really that gave me uh, any heartburn. Yeah, yeah, and I, 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 you know, I hear it. I, I'm a realist, realist, and I, I think that, you know, certainly a lot of it's going to go me. or get reduced or changed, and um, we'll see. I'll try. Right. And if everybody can consider, if uh, if you're um, uh, amicable for another day where we can do another hearing, I, if, if we can figure that out, uh, just let me know. If you can, you can't, you can't, you can't. Uh, God bless you, Bob. Thank you. Yes, sir. All right. So with that, I guess uh, we'll say goodbye, but not so long or so long, not goodbye. <laughs> Shalom. <laughs>